Order, please. Order, please. <clears throat> Just before we begin with the daily routine, as with the tradition on Budget Day in this House, with the consent of the House, we will commence with the motion for resolution number 1004, respecting the estimates under orders of the day. This means that the daily routine will be delayed until after the response to the budget speech is adjourned and question period will begin one hour after the start of the daily routine. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. With that consent, I'll now recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, pursuant to the notice uh, of motion given by me on March 7, 2018, and the rules and forms of procedure of the House of Assembly, I have the honour, by command, to present a message from His Honour, the Lieutenant Governor of the Province of Nova Scotia, relating to the estimates of sums required for the service of the province of the uh, for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2019, which is. I hereby transmit estimates of sums required for the public service of the province of the, for the year ending March 31, 2019, and in accordance with the Constitution Act 1867, recommend them, together with the budget addressed by the Minister of Finance and Treasury Board, and any resolutions or bills necessary or advisable to approve the estimates and implement the budget measures to the House of Assembly. Signed, uh, Arthur LeBlanc, Lieutenant Governor. Mr. Speaker, at this time, I wish to, number one, table the message from His Honour, the Lieutenant Governor of the province, transmitting the estimates for the consideration of the House. Number two, table the estimate books. Number three, table the government business plan. Number four, table the Crown Corporation's business plans. Number five, table the estimate and Crown Corporation's business plans resolutions. Number six, deliver my budget speech. And number seven, move that the estimates of the sums required for the province of Nova Scotia for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2019, being supplied to be granted to Her Majesty and the Crown Corporation business plans be referred to the Committee of the Whole House on Supply. The estimates are tabled. The Honourable Minister of Finance and Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are, are in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. One of the first steps in preparation for budget building is to establish a set of basic economic assumptions. Those assumptions become the foundation upon which the budget is built. It is critical that they be solid and reflect the economic conditions, not only of the province, but also of national, at the national and international levels. A true test of those assumptions is when they are presented to an economic panel consisting of representation of the major banks, academics, and private sector economists. This provides me, as Minister, with an independent assessment of the Department of Finance and Treasury Board's economic projections. On January 9th, we joined the panel in Toronto by video conference and listened intently as each economist spoke specifically about the assumptions we had submitted for them to review. Mr. Speaker, I am extremely gratified to know that their unanimous support for our assumptions were there, and they described those assumptions as, and I quote, prudent and reasonable. The economic assumptions are also central to the Office of the Auditor General's review of, and opinion on, the revenue estimates. No matters came up through the course of this work that caused any concern regarding the reasonableness of these assumptions. I would like to take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to thank staff at the Department of Finance and Treasury Board for their excellent work in determining those assumptions as they have formed the firm foundation on which this, the 2018-19 budget, has been built. Our fiscal health in Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker, is critical to our growth and our success. When we formed government in 2013, 
the province was borrowing money to pay its bills. That path is not fiscally sustainable and it does not lead to good fiscal health for the province. And that fiscal health, Mr. Speaker, is so critical for us as we need to attract new businesses and new immigrants that will drive our economy. I thank Nova Scotians for giving our government the opportunity to table the budget for 2018-19, our third consecutive balanced budget. This budget, Mr. Speaker, is projecting a surplus of $29.4 million, and we are projecting a balanced budget over each of the next four fiscal years. This improved financial health is being recognized. The Office of the Parliamentary Budget Officer has identified Nova Scotia as one of only two provinces in Canada that are on a fiscally sustainable path over the long term. Achieving that fiscal sustainability is so important as it gives us the ability to make further investments in health care and education while we continue to live within our means. The investments we make today will be affordable tomorrow and will protect our children and our grandchildren from the burden of a growing debt that they would carry. Our government embraced stronger budgetary and financial management, and I am pleased to report that three credit rating agencies have acknowledged our improved fiscal health and have recognized that in their ratings for Nova Scotia. Credit rating agencies have been downgrading some provinces, but Nova Scotia is seen as a province with a stable credit outlook. In fact, Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia is the only province whose credit rating currently has a positive outlook. These agencies, Mr. Speaker, are independent, and their analysis and ratings reflect their views on our province's credit worthiness. Dominion Bond Rating Services, Standard & Poor's, and Moody's have all cited the province's long-term commitment to fiscal prudence and strong financial management practices as being positive. With, the, with this solid financial foundation, the positive and improving credit ratings, strong financial management practices, and controlled departmental spending we are in an excellent position to invest in programs and services that Nova Scotians need and deserve. We can see that those investments and strategic decisions we made over the last four years are providing real results for Nova Scotia. Our wine industry is growing and receiving international recognition. Our fisheries exports are soaring, with exports for 2017 being at an all-time high of $2 billion. Our startup ecosystem is considered one of the best in the country. Our ocean tech sector is a shining example on the international stage. Our world-class artists, musicians, book publishers, and craft producers are exporting their works around the world. Our tourism industry shows the highest number of tourists in our history. Year after year, we continue to set new tourism records. Mr. Speaker, our population in Nova Scotia is the highest ever. Since April 1st of 2015, Nova Scotia's population has increased by 16,555 for a total population of 957,600 Nova Scotians. Mr. Speaker, those results are, uh, are the results of three important factors. Number one, more young people are staying in or returning to Nova Scotia than are leaving. And it is the first time in three decades, Mr. Speaker, that we have seen that trend. Second, more immigration, including interprovincial migration, means more people are choosing Nova Scotia for their home. Thirdly, Mr. Speaker, our investments in sectors where Nova Scotia has a competitive, competitive advantage have created more jobs and more opportunities for people here.
In fact, Mr. Speaker, the latest job numbers show there are more full-time jobs in Nova Scotia now than at any point in our history. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, since coming into office in October of 2013, there have been 16,000 new full-time jobs added to our province's economy. We saw growth in both Nova Scotia's employment and its labour force for the first time since 2012, and that strength is reflected in retail spending, which is up 6.2 per cent over last year. Working with our post-secondary institutions, businesses and social enterprise communities has reversed the trend of youth out-migration. One measure of how a province is performing in the is the ratio of net debt to GDP. When we formed government, the net debt to GDP ratio was at 38.2 per cent. The One Nova Scotia Commission challenged the province to reduce that ratio to 30 per cent by 2024. I'm proud to say that each year since 2014, that ratio has decreased from 38.2 per cent in 2014 to 35.8 per cent in 2017, and we are on track to achieve the 30 per cent by 2024. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, these successes take time, they take a plan, and they take determination, and they together make our province stronger. Continued strategic investment by our government will continue to move this province forward. We are a stronger province and we are in a positive financial position. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, since coming to office, we acted to strengthen our health care system. Throughout, through our investments, we were able to hire more doctors, reduce the wait list for home care, perform more orthopedic surgeries, and there has been progress, Mr. Speaker, but I clearly want to acknowledge on behalf of our government that we know there is more work to be done. The Health Minister spent time meeting with nurses, doctors, pharmacists, and other health professionals. We listened to Nova Scotians, and Mr. Speaker, this budget reflects what we heard. Our top health care priority is improving access to primary health care including access to family doctors. Mr. Speaker, in the last year, more than 100 new doctors were hired to help the people of this province. However, we continue to look for new ways to bring more doctors here to practice. We are making investments to advance several initiatives to help train, retain, and recruit more doctors. We recently announced $39.6 million as part of a multi-year plan to recognize the dedication of our family doctors to their profession and to their patients. Our doctors are essential, Mr. Speaker, to the health care system, and we value their commitment. We want to thank Doctors Nova Scotia for working with us to develop a suite of incentives to support our family doctors, to attract new ones, and to address the 811 need a family practice list. This year, we are providing $19.6 million towards that multi-year plan. Mr. Speaker, we will be offering doctors with an established family practice or who are establishing a family practice an increase in their compensation Mr. Speaker, family doctors will get a raise. We know there are doctors waiting for, we know there are Nova Scotians waiting for a family doctor, and it is a priority for this government to help increase access to primary care. We want to reduce the wait list, and we cannot do it without the help of family doctors. As part of our plan, Funding is available for incentives that are specifically structured to encourage doctors to take on more patients. Our patient attachment incentive will pay doctors who accept new patients from the 811 list, patients referred from an emergency department, and patients from a practice where a doctor is retiring or relocating. Mr. Speaker, our technology incentive is a pilot project that pays doctors to communicate with their patients through telephone and e-health services. 
This will improve a patient's access to care and help doctors work more efficiently, which we hope will also allow them to take on more patients. Our enrollment incentive encourages doctors to develop an up-to-date patient list. This will help us work with doctors to establish a new primary care payment model that supports collaborative practice and helps them again see more patients. We will also compensate doctors who use electronic medical records. This will help improve overall quality of care in their practice. Mr. Speaker, our health care system needs to reflect how new doctors want to practice. When health professionals work together, they can take on more patients and people get healthier and will see their quality of life improve. Mr. Speaker, we are investing an additional $8 million to increase the number of collaborative care teams across the province and to enhance existing teams. And this brings our total annual investment to $17.6 million. In addition, Mr. Speaker, we are funding more residency spaces at Dalhousie Medical School. We know if people train here, they are more likely to stay here. This budget contains funding for up to 10 new doctors to come through the Practice Ready Assessment Program. And in addition to this, our government recently announced a new immigration stream that will make it easier for internationally trained doctors to move and work here. We are only the second province in the country to offer a dedicated immigration stream for doctors, and we already have three recruits. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, if doctors want to access our tuition support program, it will forgive up to $120,000 of a doctor's tuition if they are willing to practice in an underserviced community for five years. This will bring more doctors to both rural and urban communities that are in need. We have also provided more flexibility for doctors to determine where they want to practice in Nova Scotia. The way we look at delivering primary health care is changing. So too are expectations and social awareness for mental health issues. With this budget, Mr. Speaker, we are taking steps to provide better access to mental health services, provide more mental health supports in our schools, and combat the problem of opioid addiction in Nova Scotia. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this budget contains $2.9 million more for mental health, health services through the Department of Health for a total of $287 million. Those Nova Scotians facing a mental health crisis do need more support, and our investments are providing funds to reduce the wait list, which is already too long. Providing better access to these crucial services is necessary in communities throughout the province, and this budget funds an expansion of community-based mental health supports to help those areas without quick access to an outpatient clinic. We recognize, Mr. Speaker, the importance of combating opioid addiction. Over the last year, we reduced wait lists for treatment and provided more specialist support. To keep, buildings on this, to keep building on this success, Mr. Speaker, this budget provides $3 million for the second year of the Opioid Action Plan, bringing the total to your, to your total to $5.7 million. Mr. Speaker, we will focus on further reducing wait lists, providing better access to naloxone kits, funding more education for the public and training for health care providers, helping those seeking treatment, and supporting important harm reduction work in our communities. This work, Mr. Speaker, was led by Dr. Robert Strang, Chief Medical Officer for Health, and Roger Merrick, Director of Public Safety Division of the Department of Justice. Because of their efforts, even more families will get the help they so desperately need. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, many of our younger people are struggling with mental health problems, and post-secondary students may be at a particular risk due to the changes and pressures in their lives. This year, government will provide funding to pilot new technology-based interventions designed to provide essential support for their mental health. 
Student groups have asked for this support, and the Mental Health Commission of Canada has endorsed the use of online therapy tools as a way to address wait times, create additional access to care, and promote a higher quality of care. We also want, Mr. Speaker, to continue providing support to students in our schools. The Schools Plus program puts mental health resources into our schools, and to date, it has been available to support 87,000 students, which is 74% of the total student population. We will continue, Mr. Speaker, to expand this program each year until it is available to every student in this province. Youth health centers are school-based initiatives that also support student health. They offer our young people a range of services, including health education, health information and referrals, follow-up and support, and some clinical services. There are youth health centers currently in 70 schools staffed by part-time and full-time health coordinators. Government will provide an additional $1 million to support these centers. Mr. Speaker, this budget will increase the take-home therapies provided, the take-home therapies program by $1.2 million for a total of $2 million. That is take-home cancer therapy program. This will help Nova Scotians who are facing exceptionally high costs for take-home cancer drugs, and it will allow them to focus on their health rather than their medical expenses. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians want to live at home for as long as possible. That is why, since coming to office, we have continued to increase funding for home care services each year. Our efforts to fund and improve home care have produced results for Nova Scotians. The home care support wait list has been reduced by 72%, and this budget provides even more funding, $5.5 million to address the ongoing demand. And this brings the total budget for home care services to $266 million. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we want to support families whose loved ones can no longer take care of themselves at home. The Caregiver Benefit Program is there for them. $400 a month is available to those who provide unpaid care for 20 or more hours per week to an adult with high or very high care needs. This year's expansion will support 600 more caregivers, bringing the total who can benefit from this program to more than 2,500 Nova Scotians. Mr. Speaker, successfully receiving a hip or knee replacement dramatically changes a person's quality of life. In this year's budget, there is an additional $8.8 .8 million to strengthen the province's orthopedic surgical services. It will allow orthopedic teams to better respond to more of their patients' needs and thus reduce wait times. Since 2013, government has added $24.3 million to the budget for hip and knee surgeries, bringing the total number of surgeries performed in the last four years to 14,000 surgeries. That's 14,000 Nova Scotians who have a better quality of life. Our multi-year plan for orthopedic surgery means we can dramatically reduce those wait times even more. With this, additional, this year's additional funding, we will increase the number of surgeries uh, by 350 for a total of 4,200 surgeries this year alone. As well, this funding supports creating a central booking process, making better use of operating rooms across the province, hiring more surgeons, and offering prehabilitation services that help patients prepare for a successful surgery. Mr. Speaker, Dr. Marcy Saxbrowaite and Dr. Eric Howitt are the co-chairs of the Provincial Orthopedic Working Group. Their work and our continued investment will bring us closer to the six-month national standard for wait times. 
Mr. Speaker, the working group and Nova Scotia surgeons developed this multi-year plan. Their opinions and expertise were a critical part of that process. Mr. Speaker, this budget reflects our focus on reducing wait times for family doctors, for mental health supports, for home care, and for surgeries. This is how we build a healthier, stronger Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, beginning with our first budget, we invested in supports for our students and to improve our classrooms. With the support of our federal partners, this budget includes $15.5 million to support early childhood education programs that are accessible, affordable, and inclusive. In February, Mr. Speaker, we changed the Nova Scotia Child Care Subsidy Program so that more families across the province could receive more funding toward the cost of regulated child care. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we will also ensure the long-term sustainability of a professional team of early childhood educators through the implementation of workforce development initiatives in cooperation with our post-secondary universities. And Mr. Speaker, last year marked an historic moment in our province's history as we launched a free, all-day pre-primary program. <laughs> this play-based program provides children with learning experiences, helps develop their social and emotional skills, and supports a successful transition to public school. The pre-primary program is about helping the province's four-year-olds be the best four-year-olds they can be. And the research is clear, Mr. Speaker. Giving children access to a high-quality early learning program in the year before they start school puts them in a better state of readiness when they arrive. It is a game-changer, Mr. Speaker, for children, for families, and for the education system. The 2018-19 budget includes a further $17.6 million investment. It will add up to 130 more classes for a total of about 184 classes in communities from Glace Bay to Yarmouth. The pre-primary program will continue to expand until every four-year-old in the province has access. Investments like these help families access a free uh, program for four-year-olds. They help many women get back into the workforce. And of greatest importance, they give our children, regardless of their socioeconomic status, the best possible start along their learning path. It provides an affordable option for parents. This year's education and early childhood development budget remains focused on improving classroom conditions by working with teachers. We continue to fund the council to improve classroom conditions, and this council, Mr. Speaker, uh, consists mainly of classroom teachers. It provides direction on how we spend new funding earmarked for improving classrooms and for helping students. Last year, with a budget of $10 million, the Council recommended hiring 139 new teachers to cap class sizes from grades 7 to 12 and to address junior high math and literacy supports. It brought in the first provincial attendance policy and invested in projects designed to help those students who are frequently absent from class. These improvements will be continued to be funded during the 1819 budget. Mr. Speaker, our government looks forward to the Council's recommendations on how to invest the additional $10 million, which we have added also to this budget, for a total of $20 million. We've been clear, Mr. Speaker, improving the model of inclusion in our schools in the province is a priority. We launched the Commission on Inclusive Education to help us develop a plan that will support our children in our system who need it the most. This budget has $15 million to begin implementing recommendations from the Commission. Mr. Speaker, 
improving this system will help students and it will ensure that teachers can focus on what they do best and that's teaching. This means active involvement from other departments as well, like health and wellness and community services, to provide a variety of supports based on student needs. We know there are communities, Mr. Speaker, in need of new schools. As recommended by Dr. Avis Glaze in her report and by the Auditor General, we are developing a plan for new school construction. By June 2018, we will release our plan that will outline our roadmap for new school projects. And this plan, Mr. Speaker, will reflect priorities that have been identified by school boards. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our population is growing. Young people are starting to see Nova Scotia as a place of opportunity and our key economic sectors are prospering. Momentum is with us, but we need to keep moving, keep growing, and keep finding new opportunities for growth. We want to build on our tremendous immigration success by providing more funds to help market our province abroad and by providing more support to immigrants who choose uh, to call Nova Scotia their home. Immigration strengthens our economy, it grows our population, it revitalizes our communities, and it adds to our province's diversity. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, interprovincial migration is also helping to realize that increase we are seeing in our youth population. Lauren Hodgkins works as an agricultural research technician at Nova Eel, a company owned by Nova Scotia glass eel fishermen who are investing in eel farming technology. Lauren came to study at Dalhousie University from her home province of Ontario, but says she fell in love with Nova Scotia and wants to make this her home. <laughs> Lauren McCachran is a staff scientist with Solid State Pharma here in Halifax. She hails from Coldbrook, Nova Scotia, and studied at Memorial University in St. John's for her bachelor's degree, and then at Dalhousie University for her master's. Lauren knew she wanted to stay here after graduation to lay down her own roots, and she says she's pleased to have found a career path that is aligned with her skills and education. It is great to see our Nova Scotia youth choosing a uh, to stay home and building a life here because they have fulfilling work and a connection to this province. It is also great to hear stories from young people who grew up in other places and see opportunity here. I would like to thank both Laura Hodgkins and Laura McCachran for sharing their stories with me and for joining us in the house today. Mr. Speaker, we need to keep building on this success by continuing to invest in programs that help young Nova Scotians get their first job and build a career here. We are investing more than $18 million in a suite of programs to achieve that goal. Our government will continue to place a high priority on co-op placements, on mentorship programs, and on other opportunities to connect more young people to their career path and to employers. The Graduate to Opportunity Program helps businesses hire recent graduates so they can get their first job after university. This budget contains $1.7 million more for this program, bringing it to a total of $6.5 million this year. This program, Mr. Speaker, was launched in 2015 and provides salary contributions to eligible businesses that hire recent graduates. The offset is 25% in the first year and 12.5% in the second year, and employers will now receive an additional 10% subsidy in the first year for diverse and international hires. Since launching this program, Mr. Speaker, we have helped more than 500 graduates get their first job. This year, Mr. Speaker, we are continuing to fund the Innovate to Opportunity program. With a $1.7 million investment, this program helps businesses hire those with a master's degree or PhD.
If a business is willing to hire a young person with these qualifications, pay them at least $60,000 per year, government will subsidize a portion of those wages between 35 and 50 percent in the first year, 20 and 25 percent in the second year, and 12 percent in the third year. And Mr. Speaker, these graduates will enter the business or the company, they will help conduct research, and they will find new ideas to help the business grow. Mr. Speaker, this program is a win-win. A young person gets a job and valuable experience, and a business gets help with their research and development. The government shows support for both with those investments. One of the first companies on board with the Innovate to Opportunity program was Remote, a local information technology and communications company. Its chief technology officer, James Craig, says he has enjoyed working with university researchers in the past, and through this new program, he has hired Walter Adba, who has the skills that align well with the company's work and will help them compete globally. I would like to thank James and Walter for coming to the House today, along with their CEO, Andrew Boswell. I wish them best of luck, and I expect, Mr. Speaker, that Remote's example will be followed by many others because of the Innovate to Opportunity program. This year, we will also continue funding the Apprenticeship Start program which supports small and medium businesses in hiring apprentices from underrepresented groups or in rural Nova Scotia. This program currently supports 700 positions across the province. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, these are the kinds of programs that will provide employment opportunities for young Nova Scotians entering the workforce. Our fisheries exports, Mr. Speaker, are soaring. The sector's exports have grown for seven consecutive years and are now valued at $2 billion. <laughs> this year's budget, Mr. Speaker, adds $5.8 million to the Atlantic Fisheries Fund for a total provincial contribution of $8.3 million this year. This program, Mr. Speaker, is delivered in partnership with the federal government and other Atlantic provinces, and it will be used to help Nova Scotian companies create new products to sustain their export growth. <laughs> the need to find long-term growth opportunities is why we also continue investing in the Aquaculture Development Program. It funds important research to help the industry increase productivity, support the Independent Review Board, and engage the public. This work, Mr. Speaker, will be complemented by the Building Tomorrow Fund. The concept for this fund is based on the very successful Honeycrisp Orchard Renewal Program. The $3 million fund will help fisheries, aquaculture, and agriculture companies as they innovate, develop, and sell new products explore new markets, and become more efficient in their operations. We will work with the industry, Mr. Speaker, as we develop this program. The Building Tomorrow Fund will also help to sustain sector growth, as will our wine development program. Last year, Mr. Speaker, sales of Nova Scotia wines topped $17 million. It is a growth category for sales at the Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation. This program has already helped to increase the number of acres of grapes planted in Nova Scotia by 40 percent, and that supports the goal of the Grape Growers Association to double their acreage by 2020. Mr. Speaker, some of our agri-food businesses already see the value in exporting and are being recognized for their efforts. From Lunenburg County, Terra Beata Farms grows cranberries, but is more significantly a processor, making products destined for local and international markets. Owner David Ernst says exporting is essential to his company, with 90% of his sales outside the region and outside the country. 
Terra Beata Farms employs 25 people directly and injects an even greater amount into the Nova Scotia economy indirectly via purchases of fruit, packaging, trucking, and other services necessary for a world-class operation. The company continues to win awards, Mr. Speaker, including a Nova Scotia Export Achievement Award last year for their export success. I'm pleased, Mr. Speaker, to welcome David and Evelyn Ernst to the House today and wish them continued success bringing Nova Scotia cranberries to the world. Mr. Speaker, we continue to work to develop our natural resources, improving regulations to make them more responsive, and keeping our environment and our communities safe. The offshore growth strategy will be extended for an additional four years. We are pioneering new geoscience research techniques for offshore exploration. This will advance our understanding of our geology and our resources. This strategy will ensure Nova Scotia is positioned to take advantage of our economic opportunity, modernize our regulations, and market investment opportunities in Nova Scotia to global investors. <clears throat> Over the coming year, Mr. Speaker, we will also transfer the Geoscience and Mining Division within the Department of Natural Resources to the Department of Energy. This will allow the merger of two teams with expertise in subsurface development, and it will enhance development opportunities. Additionally, the move will also ensure that the forest industry continues to have a dedicated departmental focus. It will be structured, Mr. Speaker, to ensure government best achieves a necessary balance between protection and preservation and sustainable development. Professor Bill Leahy is expected to conclude his review of the forest practices in Nova Scotia by the end of April, and that review will provide recommendations to government on ways to help achieve that delicate balance. Mr. Speaker, the Atlantic gold mine near Middle Muscadabit was the only new gold mine to open in Canada in 2017. <laughs> to build on this success, uh, Mr. Speaker, the government will launch the Mineral Resources Development Fund to support private sector-led mineral exploration, the development of new mines, university research, and training. The new fund will help spur investments and development, and it will also help create jobs and innovation in this primarily rural-based industry. As much, of our success, as much of our economic success depends on sending more of our products and services to other countries, we do remain focused on helping to bring more tourists to our province. Many of small businesses, whether they are restaurants, bed and breakfast, tour operators, shops, cafes, rely on tourists for their success. Our tourism sector already has had back-to-back record-setting years. We are making investments in our tourism sites and providing supports to help keep that sector growing. As part of our tourism strategy, Mr. Speaker, we need to make it easier for people to get to our province. That includes more direct flights coming to Nova Scotia from key markets in Asia, Europe, and the United States. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, improving tourist experiences once they, once they arrive in Nova Scotia is also critical. We will continue to work with other levels of government and the private sector to grow this industry. Mr. Speaker, we are improving the business climate in the province by reducing the, the tax burden on small businesses and by cutting $25 million in red tape. <laughs> that work, Mr. Speaker, is getting national recognition. In January, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business granted Nova Scotia an A- grade on reducing red tape. Our grade has steadily increased, Mr. Speaker, from a D minus in 2015. CFIB also praised our Business Navigator Service as part of its national award program. 
We launched the Navigator service as a pilot in 2017 to guide business owners through rules and regulations and allow them to focus on opening, operating, and growing their businesses. The positive response from small business communities is why government will continue to fund the service on an ongoing basis. To further improve the business climate in the province, we will introduce a new innovation equity tax credit. Beginning in 2019, it will be more narrowly focused and have a threshold similar to our neighbors. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the existing equity tax credit will be phased out over time, and this change will create more investment in high growth Nova Scotia businesses that are well positioned for a rapid scaling up for more employment and for export growth. <laughs> Sustainable development of high potential land and infrastructure to attract people and investment to Nova Scotia are both important. Waterfront development has the experience and expertise in this area. This year, its mandate will expand to become the province's strategic property development corporation. Its mandate will focus on creating opportunities for entrepreneurs in both rural and urban communities. Recently, uh, government announced the creation of a new rural internet trust with an in initial investment of an estimated $120 million. Starting this year, Mr. Speaker, funds from the Trust will be used to support projects that will help bring better internet service to underserviced communities and businesses in this province. This Trust is intended to leverage funding from the private sector and from both municipal and federal governments. The benefit of economic growth also lies in the other investments made possible by it. With a growing economy, we are able to provide more help to those who need it the most by making our province more accessible and more inclusive, by helping women who are at risk, and by making investments that will help move people out of the cycle of poverty. This uh, budget, Mr. Speaker, includes $18.3 million more to help people with disabilities. This funding will help more people transition from larger residential facilities into smaller community-based options. And this, in turn, Mr. Speaker, will enable those with disabilities to lead more independent lives. We will also provide $2 million to businesses and community groups to make their facilities more accessible to people with disabilities, whether it's their employees or their customers. At-risk women will see more supports in this budget as we continue to dedicate annual funding across de government departments to support survivors of sexual assault. Work with stakeholders to develop a provincial action plan to combat domestic violence is also an important part of this commitment. This year, $2 million will fund grants to community projects for community projects, research, and other initiatives focused on preventing domestic violence and supporting their victims. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, to help parents who receive both income assistance and child support payments, this budget provides $3.4 million. It will fully exempt child support payments from income assistance calculations. This will help about 1,500 families who will no longer have their child support payments deducted from their income. Our budget includes investments that will help break the cycle of poverty that is holding too many of our families back. We are making changes to income assistance. Our budget provides $1.5 million to fund a program that will help income assistance clients earn more money without seeing a reduction in their payments. <laughs> 
This year, we are investing $4 million for initiatives under the blueprint to end poverty as part of our four-year $20 million commitment. This will bring the total two years commitment to $6 million. And these funds, Mr. Speaker, provide grants to community organizations to test innovative ways to help address the poverty question. When we took office, Mr. Speaker, in 2013, we clearly stated that cutting the wait list for affordable housing was a top priority. Over the first term, we reduced the wait list by 20%. Over the next three years, we want to reduce that by a further 30%. Mr. Speaker, we are also investing in the current stock of public housing. $12.4 million is dedicated to improve our buildings. <laughs> Finally, Mr. Speaker, we are spending $3 million to double the tax-free poverty reduction credit from $250 to $500. Mr. Speaker, this credit is provided quarterly to income assistant clients without children who have an annual income of $12,000 or less. Increasing the credit will provide added assistance to some of the most financially vulnerable people in Nova Scotia. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, these commitments will move us closer to our goal of an inclusive Nova Scotia. <clears throat> Nova Scotia is a national leader in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and we will continue to address climate change. The province is investing $3 million a year for four years to support the federal government's new Low Carbon Economy Fund. Our investment will leverage $56 million in federal funding to create new programs and expand existing ones that help Nova Scotian homeowners and businesses become more energy efficient. This results in lower energy costs for the consumer and reduced emissions for the province. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, whether we look at the growing technology sector in Cape Breton or the flourishing tourism sector on the South Shore, we are seeing people prospering in a stronger Nova Scotia. We are witnessing numerous success stories across the province because Nova Scotia stepped up and worked together shoulder to shoulder with one another and with us. Our success, Mr. Speaker, is not just limited to our borders. Recently, a collection of organizations from Atlantic Canada promoting an ocean supercluster was awarded its share of federal innovation funding. Fifty applicants competed for funding, and this Atlantic Canadian project was selected as one of the winners. The federal funding of more than $150 million will be matched dollar for dollar by the private sector. Also, Mr. Speaker, a team from Sobey School of Business had an exciting weekend recently at the Venture Capital Investment Competition in the U.S. They took home a silver medal. This team of Nova Scotia students defeated teams from prestigious schools like Yale, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Dartmouth College. Congratulations to all team members and their coaches. <laughs> On the other side of the Atlantic, uh, Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia wine is gracing the menu of one of the top restaurants in Europe. Benjamin Bridges Brut Reserve 2008 was placed on the menu of Gordon Ramsay's three-star Michelin restaurant in London. In New York, Mr. Speaker, Old Stock, a refugee love story by Halifax-based Tubi Theatre is now playing off-Broadway. This is a true example, Mr. Speaker, of how we can create art here and export it around the world. Mr. Speaker, we are competing and winning on the international stage. We are showing what a small province filled with passionate, creative, and innovative people can do. We are able to achieve this while holding on to the traditional warmth and hospitality for which we are known. In this moment, we are showing what a new Nova Scotia confidence looks like. 
This new confidence, Mr. Speaker, gives your government pride as we sell our province to the world. This new confidence is why we, as a people and a province, will be able to capitalize on the opportunities that lie ahead. It is why we will succeed when we work together. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of our government and in the best interest of Nova Scotians, I present with both pride and optimism the 2018-19 budget. Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the, the Minister for highlighting some of the wonderful accomplishments of some Nova Scotians. I, for one, was not surprised that a team from St. Mary's defeated teams from Yale and MIT and, and, and what not have you. Did not surprise me at all. Uh, permission to make an introduction, Mr. Speaker. Permission granted. Thank you. Seated in the West Gallery, we have uh, Mr. Jeff Stewart. He's, the, he's a councillor from Colchester. He's the president for the Union of Nova Scotia Municipalities. I'm sure he's watching with interest. Thank you for joining us, Jeff. Maybe you can rise and receive a warm welcome. Out. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, politics are like statistics. They are what the government wants them to be at that particular time. And I think that's what we see a bit in this budget today. I do want to thank the minister uh, for tabling this budget. And I want to thank the staff. We know, we know uh, how many staff work so diligently behind the scenes to put a document like this together. This is actually my, my sixth budget reply. Mr. Speaker, when I started giving these replies, my hair was black. Uh, and I'm still giving these replies. So I know what, I know what is involved. I've gotten to know a number of the staff that are involved in this, and uh, they're, all, they're all good people that care about this province. They put a lot into this, and I do thank them for that. <clears throat> when looking at the budget, Mr. Speaker, it's important to be mindful of exactly what it is we're looking at. And what we are looking at when we look at the budget is what the government thinks might happen this year. It's what the government wants to happen this year. And I know in the, in, in the prior, uh, last year's uh, budget address, uh, I talked about the big spike in personal income tax revenue that the province was anticipating. And at the time, I raised some questions around that. I said I wasn't feeling it, uh, being out around the province, talking to Nova Scotians. I wasn't feeling that optimism that they were all going to uh, make more money and pay more taxes. Uh, I didn't feel it at that time, and I highlighted that as part of the budget. And lo and behold, in this budget today, we do see a pretty significant downward revision uh, in last year's personal income tax estimates. Almost $145 million was kind of overestimated at that time. So that is to bring home the point that this is only what the government hopes will happen. It is what the government wants to happen. And today... Uh, today, I will say, we're looking at the third balanced budget in a row. And uh, I do tip my hat uh, to the government for tabling a balanced budget. <clears throat> and I want to thank uh, the National Securities Commission and cannabis users uh, for producing this balanced budget. Because what we've, what we've seen in this budget today is uh, $20 million of revenue estimates for cannabis. The government expects to, uh, to, to receive $20 million of cannabis revenue. Now that will happen if, if, cannabis, uh, if cannabis becomes legal on July 1st, which it may, may not. Uh, uh, but it's based on the, on, on the uh, Liquor Corp's estimates that they'll sell 12 million grams of cannabis this year. So I'm, I am mindful of the times I've heard the government say, Cannabis will either cost the province money or be neutral, revenue neutral. That's what I remember the government saying, and I, I do see some nodding in agreement over there. And yet, in today's budget, where we see a surplus of 29 million tabled, would you believe, Mr. Speaker, that there's $20 million of revenue in those numbers and zero expenses? 
The government has not booked this to be neutral. The government has not booked this to be a money loser. It's booked it to be a $20 million good guy, a cash cow. Now, Mr. Speaker, that number might be a little high. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, time will tell. But if you take that out, there's something in the air around that number, as my colleague says. Um, and the other amount that, that I found very interesting when you look at these budgets, and remember, we go into budget lockup at 8.30 this morning and we receive hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents. And we've gone through that in four or five hours and tried to identify what's happening. But this year, this year the province may sign on to the National Securities Regulator. They may ha it may happen. And if they do, if they are able to negotiate going on to that, the province will receive a one-time payment, a little bonus of sorts, as you would, Mr. Speaker. And would you believe that that amount is $77 million? So for this year, in these numbers that we're looking at, we see $17 million, give or take, that the province profits every year from running our own um, securities regulation system, plus $77 million of a one-time uh, windfall. So, Mr. Speaker, when you look at the $20 million of cannabis revenue that's going direct to the bottom line, and a $77 million one-time windfall uh, from the National Securities Commission, those are pretty big numbers, Mr. Speaker. And you, you can see how timing is everything. And politics are like statistics. Um, because if not for those numbers, we would not be looking at a surplus today, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so, um, so we are we looking we are looking at a balanced budget, but we need to be mindful of the numbers that make up that number. And what I what I would say, I will say that this government has done a decent job of bringing the actual results in line with the budget numbers, and we can we can talk about whether that's been good or not, and we'll, we will talk about that, Mr. Speaker. But if we look at the budget that was tabled um, in September, there was a budget $21 million surplus, and the actual number we're looking at today is about 23. So I will, I will acknowledge that th those numbers, you know, what they budgeted to happen, has pretty much actually happened, and that's, uh, that's a good thing. But, but Mr. Speaker, we need, to, we need to think about a value for money. And I, I use the example sometimes, if you have $100, you're going to grow, go to the grocery store with your $100 and you want to spend $100 on, on groceries, and you walk out and you've spent $200, well, you, you kind of blown the budget. But if you walk out with $100, then you, you, you stayed within your budget. And, and what we might be looking at here is that the government has stayed within their budget. But what if those $100 worth of groceries you walk out with are $100 worth of candy bars when you needed vegetables and meat. Well then in that case, Mr. Speaker, staying within your budget doesn't actually deliver what you need delivered. And we need to be, we need to be mindful when we think about, when we think about three balanced budgets in a row, one before us and two behind us, uh, we ask us, have those two balanced budgets that are behind us uh, been good? Have, have the taxpayers got value for money? Have they delivered what the, taxpayers, uh, what the taxpayers need? Or is this government's track record one of $100 worth of candy bars? And, and time will tell, but what I would say is that the last two balanced budgets have not been good for those Nova Scotians that need a doctor, for those Nova Scotians that have children in school, for those Nova Scotians that live on a road, these balanced budgets haven't been good for them or those looking for a job. Because leadership goes beyond allocating money. You can budget money, you can allocate money, but what you really need is the leadership to properly manage the investment. That's what's important. And in this province, we're spending $10.8 billion. Um, it should be enough to run the affairs of the province and deliver the services to the people, we're spending $10.8 billion. 
And leadership means making sure that we get value for that $10.8 billion. And that is the question uh, that Nova Scotians have to ask themselves. Are they getting bang for the buck under this government? And I think when you start to look at health care, and in health care, we're spending over, over $4 billion. We have less than a million people. I think $4 billion plus dollars should be enough. And Mr. Speaker, I ask you, does it feel like enough? Does it feel like it's being spent properly when we have 100,000 Nova Scotians without a doctor? When we have Nova Scotians dying on stretchers in hallways of hospitals? When we have places like Pictou County, today, no psychiatrists. Not one, Mr. Speaker. No ambulances available. Four billion dollars should be enough. Why isn't it enough? And Mr. Speaker, I would submit to you that it's because of, it is because of a lack of leadership. It is because of a lack of good management. When we, when we think about what's happening in healthcare, it always feels like we're playing catch up. It always feels like there's a crisis. It doesn't feel like anyone has control over what is happening. There's always a panic uh, situation. And that is what many Nova Scotians feel. And last year, when I look at, when, when we talk about the surplus and the numbers that are delivered, and I mentioned the surplus, 23 million today, they're reporting, is higher than what was budgeted in September. And you ask, how does that happen? It happens by a variety of things. One, right in healthcare, which we talk a lot about in this house, this government underspent um, the, the budget that they had available to them for health care clinicians, uh, mental health clinicians, by $4 million. The money was there in the budget, but it wasn't spent. That is not providing service to Nova Scotians. And that $4 million wasn't spent, but this year, in the budget we see before us today, let's all hail good news, $2.9 million for mental health. $4 million was available last year. They didn't spend it. This year, they do a little bait and switch with $2.9 million. It's actually less than what they had last year. Do they not understand the need to deliver services? We need to scrape past the bottom line of a balanced budget. The money is there. The money needs to be spent properly to the benefit of Nova Scotians. And when I look at the, the, the budget this year, it's often in this house we hear, we, I feel health care is in crisis, my colleagues feel health care is in crisis, and, and often the government says, no, that's not true. Uh, we do see in the budget today $30 million in health care for quote-unquote rising demand. $30 million for rising demand. Um, and we see things like $6.8 million allocated to, for, for ambulance services for increased call volume. So, Mr. Speaker, these things need to tie together. We have to start looking at the issue as a whole instead of throwing little band-aids on because there's nothing in this budget, there's no new long-term care beds in this budget. Zero. Not one. And there are no structural changes to the way long-term care is delivered. And we know that ambulances are backed up out front of emergency rooms because they can't get into the bays, because they can't get people into the hospital because of the chaos that's happening inside the hospital. So what is the point? What is the point of allocating $6.8 million for increased call volumes, which, by the way, the call volumes are increasing because people don't have access to primary care, so they're calling ambulances. What is the point of allocating $6.8 million to increase call volumes when you haven't addressed the structural issues in the system? It's a fool's game, Mr. Speaker. It's, it's managing to the podium. It's managing to you get the microphone in your face and you get to hail the good news of $2.9 million 
for mental health, or the good news of $6.8 million for ambulatory services. But you haven't addressed the structural problems. And the worst part about it, for me, Mr. Speaker, is doctors are problem solvers. If we would work with doctors, they could help solve some of these problems. Instead, our government is at war with doctors, in the courts with doctors. Why don't we tap into some of the problem-solving abilities of doctors to address some of the structural issues that lay before us in the system? It's not enough to throw money at something. It's not enough to address, to move all the numbers around the spreadsheet and say, look, there, we've balanced the budget. You have to deliver the services to Nova Scotians. When the services are delivered and the balance and the budget properly is balanced, then we can hail victory, but not until then. Today, we have a health care system where doctors, the very people that are supposed to keep people healthy, are being made unhealthy by their jobs. A young doctor told me that looking care, look, taking care of people's health is impacting his health. I will never forget uh, Andy making that statement to me, the power it had over me. We shouldn't be in a situation like that. It's time government back up the investment with proper leadership and proper management. That's what needs to happen. Until then, how can people trust the government to spend money wisely? Look at education. Is $1.4 billion enough money to educate 20,000 students? That's the question that should be asked. Has the government looked at that? Has the government actually done an analysis or have they filled in the numbers on the spreadsheet to make the, ba the, the budget balance? When we, when we look at money that's being spent, we have to focus on, uh, it's like many times what the government is doing is renovating the house while the roof is on fire. <coughs> we need to understand that the roof is on fire, and put that out, and then build the house. That's what we should be doing with our, with our, with our spending decisions. The education system needs to be modernized. It's time for, to modernize the education system, and I have some advice for the government on how they could do that. Ask teachers. <laughs> they understand where the investment is required. And today we see $15 million to uh, begin to address the, the recommendations of the uh, Commission on Inclusive Education. $15 million. Um, that's a nice... I too am happy to see the government taking that report seriously. That report will be released on, on Monday, I believe, Mr. Speaker. And I question, where does the number come from? Is it enough? Is it for additional staffing? Is it for physical changes to class? What is it for? Is it yet again a number from the air. These are the questions that Nova Scotians are asking. Um, who is quantifying what is required? Who has the vision for education? Who can tell this house where education is going in this province and why the investments are being made? I see the minister, the minister raised his hand and I will Welcome when he uses an opportunity to share that vision with this House because before the March break we had hours and hours of debate. And it is hard for Nova Scotians to understand where this is going. Is it just a few little pieces here and there? Mr. Speaker, teachers are problem solvers. Teachers are problem solvers. They need to be involved in the process. And yet they feel devalued and disrespected by this government. And what a shame that is, Mr. Speaker. And despite it all, teachers like uh, Melissa from Anaganesh, who uh, spent her Friday night of March break grading papers. Uh, 
teachers like uh, John, who is, who's not a manager, but is a vice principal, and a, a good one. He had quite an impact on, on the many people that I know. And like my friend Kelly uh, in the classroom, teachers like those three and the other thousands of them in this province, they feel devalued and disrespected. And yet, they get up and they go to their classroom every day with enthusiasm and commitment and focus on the students. And it's time that the government supported them and backed them up. We need a government that recognizes the, the value of value for money. And in a $10 billion budget, there are, there are many good things. And there are many disappointments. And I do, I do have, uh, I got asked a lot leading into the budget, would I look for one thing? Tim, would you look for one thing? And the question I got asked the most, the question I got asked most was, will you look and see if there's any money to fix my water, I live in Harriet's Field. And do you know, Mr. Speaker, there's not a penny in here for that. Despite quite a serious election promise that said it was coming a year later, there's bad news for the people of that area. Nothing in this budget for their water. There's some interesting news. There's some interesting news, there's some interesting news around other items that I get asked. Um, it, it, it's, it's interesting that the member for the area finds it funny that there's nothing in this budget for his people. <clears throat> there's some interesting news in this budget as well, Mr. Speaker. Some interesting news. Um, uh, we know that the debt service and costs have gone up $60 million. $60 million debt is, is inching up. The debt of the province continues to inch up. The service and costs uh, continue to inch up. $60 million in increase of service costs, four times as much as allocated to inclusive education. Um, just for perspective, Mr. Mr. Speaker, there is all kinds of different types of news um, in this budget. But what I would say, one of, the, one of the things that was most disappointing to me was the, the uh, failure to recognize seniors in this budget. The Department of Seniors... <clears throat> Department of Seniors budget, $3 million. Nine people, $3 million. The Department of Seniors budget, 0.025% of all spending. 0.025% of all spending. Mr. Speaker, seniors make up 20% of the province. Senior spending makes up 0.025. Now, the government might say that that department is responsible for making sure that other departments invest in seniors. But when you ask the number, how much is allocated to seniors across the government, there is no answer. Nobody knows, Mr. Speaker. You ask the Department of Health how much is allocated to health care, they'll tell you. You know what's allocated to health care, uh, to mental health care uh, from the health budget, Mr. Speaker? 6.6%. 6.6% of four plus billion dollars is allocated to mental health care. They'll tell you the number just like that. You ask the government how much of our spending goes to seniors, it's a shrug of the shoulders, Mr. Speaker. And should we be surprised? Last year, in September, when the minister gave um, the, the budget um, uh, commentary in the Red Room, it's a beautiful little poster beside the minister, it's there again today, key priorities of government. And I remember that poster from September, five key priorities of government. Healthier people and communities. Investing in early years in education safe and, com and connected communities, inclusive economic um, growth. That's four. Now in September, there was one more. It said caring for seniors. Would you believe, Mr. Speaker? That's gone right now. Over there today, when you walk in the Red Room, that key priority of this government is gone, as evidenced, as evidenced by the budget allocation to seniors. 
What a shame, Mr. Speaker. Serious disappointment uh, for me to see that. People want politicians to be problem solvers, just like doctors are problem solvers and teachers are problem solvers. They expect their politicians to be pro problem solvers as well, not masters of statistics. Not masters of statistics. And what we, what we did see today in the minister's response, the minister talked about all the new jobs that have been created since this government has taken um, the helm, I guess, for lack of a better word. I checked it out during the speech, Mr. Speaker, and it's right, right here in, in, in black and white for everyone to see in the, in, the, in the budget, stronger services and supports at the back. When this government, in 2013, uh, the labour force of this province was 497,000. And, and listening to the commentary today from the government, I expected that number to be much higher. Higher than 497,000. Well, Mr. Speaker, imagine my surprise when I looked and saw that as of 2017, the labour force is smaller. People don't want their politicians to be statisticians. They want them to be brokers of the truth in what's happening in this province, Mr. Speaker. And when I look at the number of people working in this province, in 2013, 452,000 people working in this province. 452,000. Well, maybe that number went up, Mr. Speaker, over all the wonder, wonderful economic growth we've had over these three balanced budgets. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It didn't go up. Uh-oh. <laughs> A little premature on the applause. <clears throat> and neither does a shrinking workforce deserve applause. Because there are only 449,000 people working. Mr. Speaker, we can table balanced budgets from here till the sun goes down. But the issue is fewer people are working. And we can estimate higher personal income tax revenue again this year, which we did. And I will say it again. When I travel this province, and I have been traveling this province on a small project I have on the go, when I travel this province, when I travel this province, I don't feel it. I don't feel it, Mr. Speaker. I don't feel that people are excited about their economic prospects. I don't feel like they feel they're going to pay more tax next year. And, and, the, and the reality is, is that when I said that last year, I hope I'm not right again, Mr. Speaker. It gets tiring. I hope I'm not right again. But see, and we have to adjust the estimates downward again. And we have to adjust them downwards again. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, 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 I just, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the bottom line, the bottom line is throwing money at things without managing, without showing leadership, is not problem solving, throwing money at things without managing them is problem stretching. We need to be done with problem stretching in this province. We need problem solvers because it is time to raise the standard in this province where people can expect access to health care, where people can expect the very best of education by working with the teachers that know the changes that need to be made. It's time we improve Nova Scotia because when, uh, Nova, when governments listen to people and do what the people on the front lines and on the ground know needs to be done, that is when uh, we will all win, Mr. Speaker. And this budget does not evidence a lot of winning for many people, except the government who can go to a podium and say our third balanced budget in a row. But the rest of Nova Scotians need to dig a few deeper. So with those few words, with those few words, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to adjourn debate uh, on this process for today. <clears throat> motion is to adjourn debate on the budget address. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. We'll now move on to the daily routine. Daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions, presenting reports of committees, tabling reports, regulations, and other papers, statements by ministers, 
Government notices of motion. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, hereby give notice in a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas today I stand in the House of Assembly wearing a tie with the official tartan of the County of Colchester, and whereas this tartan, made of hunting tartan's colours, reflects the red soil along the Bay of Fundy, cross woven with green from the forest and the blue of the rivers and the bay, with gold from the flowers of the Colchester flag, which represents the Acadians, and the black stitching together from the medicine wheel that represents the Mi'kmaq. And whereas today the member from Colchester North, Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier, presented her second consecutive balanced budget in this house to all Nova Scotians as a proud daughter of Colchester County. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the House of Assembly congratulate Colchester County on honouring their history with this new tartan. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Will all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Acadian Affairs. Uh, Monsieur le Président, à une date ultérieure, je demanderai l'adoption de la résolution suivante. Attendu que cette année marque le 30e anniversaire de la Journée internationale de la francophonie, et attendu que aujourd'hui, le 20 mars, 274 millions de francophones sur cinq continents célébreront la langue française et la merveilleuse diversité de la francophonie mondiale. Et attendu que la Nouvelle-Écosse, avec l'établissement de l'Acadie il y a plus de 400 ans, est devenue le berceau de la francophonie canadienne et qu'elle abrite aujourd'hui encore une communauté acadienne et francophone dynamique. Par conséquent, il est résolu que les députés de l'Assemblée législative se joignent à moi pour souhaiter à tous les Acadiens et francophones de la Nouvelle-Écosse, du Canada et d'ailleurs dans le monde, une excellente 30e journée internationale de la francophonie. Monsieur le Président, je demande l'adoption de cette résolution sans préavis et sans débat. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas this year marks the 30th anniversary of International Francophonie Day, and whereas today, March 20, 274 million Francophones on five continents will be celebrating the French language and the wonderful diversity of the world's Francophonie. And whereas Nova Scotia, with the establishment of Acadie over 400 years ago, became the birthplace of the Canadian Francophonie, and to this day is home to a dynamic and vibrant Acadian and Francophone community. Therefore, be it resolved that members of the House of Assembly join me in wishing all Acadians and Francophones in Nova Scotia in Canada and elsewhere in the world, an excellent 30th International Francophonie Day. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. But all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Bedford on an introduction. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would draw the member's attention to the East Gallery, where we are joined today by a, a friend of Nova Scotia, Dan McKenzie, originally from Cape Breton. His, uh, his military career took him out of province, but I'm here to tell you that he's bought some property back in Nova Scotia, and he's looking forward to, to coming back. Dan, please rise and receive the warm welcome of the House. We'll now move on to introduction of bills. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled, An Act to Develop a Computer Application for Mental Health Resources. Here, here. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition begs leave to introduce a bill entitled, An Act to Develop 
a computer application for mental health resources. Bill number 88, an act to develop a computer application for mental health resources. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled an act respecting gender neutral identification. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting General Gender Neutral Identification. Bill number 89, An Act Respecting Gender Neutral Identification. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to uh, introduce a bill entitled an act to amend Chapter 1 of the Acts of 1995-96, the Education Act. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 1 of the Acts of 1995-96, the Education Act. Bill number 90, an act to amend chapter one of the acts of 1995-96, the Education Act. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled, an act to amend chapter 44 of the acts of 2005, the Pre-Primary Education Act. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 44 of the Acts of 2005, the Pre-Primary Education Act. Bill number 91, An Act to Amend Chapter 44 of the Acts of 2005, the Pre-Primary Education Act. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. We'll now move on to notices of motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Member for Picto West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wish to acknowledge and congratulate Scottsburn Recreation on another successful winter carnival, which took place over the weekend of February 2nd to the 4th. The weekend included a dance at the fire hall, a pancake breakfast, coasting, sleigh rides, 4-H bean supper, snowshoeing, dodgeball, and a bring a friend to church service. It was an entertaining and joyous weekend filled with many exciting events. I believe it is important to recognize the organizers organizers, volunteers, community groups, local businesses and participants that all made this winter carnival a resounding success. Scottsburn Recreation demonstrates what a hard working group of dedicated community members can truly accomplish in a small rural community. We look forward to many more winter carnivals and the community spirit that they inspire throughout Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the work of the Dartmouth Community Health Board. When residents of Dartmouth expressed a wish for accessible and affordable ways to become more active or participate in physical activity, the Dartmouth Community Health Board jumped into action and created the Dartmouth Recreation and Open Space Asset Map. This is a free interactive online resource created by nursing student Brenda Swinimer that outlines extensive free and low-cost recreation assets within Dartmouth. Trails, parks, playgrounds, fields, and other recreational spaces are identified by color-coded icons. This, is, this truly is an ongoing community-based project created out of the local knowledge of recreation experts and community members alike. While more resources are undoubtedly needed to promote health and wellness within our community, the Dartmouth Community Health Board's asset map is an innovative grassroots approach to improving health for everyone. Please join me in recognizing the forward-thinking work of this dedicated board of volunteers. The Honourable Member for King South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to share with the House that Goose Cap First Nation was recently named Community Economic Developer of the Year at the 2017 Council for the Advancement of Native Development Officers Conference in Fredericton. 
Economic development in this King South First Nations community over the past several years has been incredible and is highlighted by significant growth in their commercial fishery operation and an impressive new commercial development that will open this spring. This small, young First Nation is certainly punching above its weight in terms of economic development, and they are very deser deserving recipients of this prestigious national award. I invite all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Chief Sid Peters and the Goose Cap First Nation on this well-earned recognition and on their tremendously successful economic development efforts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge and thank all of the members of the Benin Mission to Africa. 13 Nova Scotians went to Benin in January, joined by three medical students, a doctor and a nun from Brazil. Dr. Louis Bourget and his sister, Dr. Monique Bourget, started the foundation eight years ago. This year, I was privileged to travel with them, their daughter Renee, nurse Judy Boucher, anesthesiologist Dr. Ann Aylmer and Dr. Vanessa Sweet, surgeons Dr. Kevin Johnson and Todd Stoddard, dental hygienist Beverly McNeil, electrician Doug McDonald, manager Dave Clark and Sarah Daly, our chief cook and manager. Together we completed 51 surgeries and provided medical care to over 800 patients. This was an unforgettable 10-day trip where living in a thatched hut was the norm and where only one in five babies died after after birth. I ask everyone in the legislature to join me in thanking this amazing Benin team for their wonderful humanitarian work. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, National Volunteer Week will be observed this year from April 15th to 21st. Volunteers from across Nova Scotia will be honoured here in Halifax, and the province holds its annual volunteer award ceremony on Monday, April 9th. Among those being honoured will be Yarmouth's Tony Dorian, who was selected by the Municipality of Yarmouth as its Volunteer of the Year for 2018. Tony Dorian is co-chair of the Yarmouth County Community Health Board and is also involved with Yarmouth's annual 10,000 Villages event and with the St. Ambrose Refugee Committee. I am proud to recognize Tony Dorian today and I ask this House of Assembly in joining me in congratulating him on being named the Municipality of Yarmouth's Volunteer of the Year for 2018 and in thanking him for giving his time and effort to those in need in our community. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Donnie Gavin Murray of Glasgow may be in his 80s, but he still loves to talk sports with anyone willing to listen. Murray played softball in the Steel Town, junior hockey in the county, and was considered one of the best bowlers in the area. His most enjoyable outing was always arriving at the Abercrombie Golf Club with his friends before the break of dawn, anxiously waiting for enough daylight to see balls soaring into the sky. Donnie was very quick to say that the two best professional teams in the world were the Maple Leafs for hockey and the Red Sox for baseball. Over the decades, he made numerous trips to Maple Leaf Gardens and Fenway Park. Although he's not on the golf course seven mornings a week, he's still willing to share numerous stories from his years involved around sports. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the 2017 Outstanding Retailers Awards were handed out this past November. This national award ceremony recognized Bridgewater's Gow's Home Hardware for the Best Hardware Store Award, the third time this store has received the honor. Owner Amanda Fancy is the sixth generation of the family owned and operated business. The staff at Bridgewater's Gow's Home Hardware are a close-knit group whose focus on our community is evident in their support of local nonprofits and charities throughout the area. Always friendly, Bridge Bridgewater's Gows is the first stop for many, from contractors to do-it-yourselfers, people like me. Staff is there to help you find what you're looking for and make helpful suggestions along the way. Congratulations to owner Amanda Fancy and the staff of Bridgewater's Gows Home Hardware for this outstanding and well-deserved national recognition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Mr. Speaker, at a time when health care is in the news every day, it is vital that we continue to remind the health care workers in our province they are appreciated, they are respected, and they are valued. Dartmouth East resident Dr. Jason Young is a cardiologist at the Dartmouth General Hospital, and we know in Dartmouth East how lucky we are to have him. He has a reputation as being professional and direct while being empathetic and comforting to his patients. Caring staff members can be the difference makers at a very trying time, Mr. Speaker. I'm so proud to have Dr. Young both living and working in my community, and I know those who have been his patient feel the same way. 
Mr. Speaker, I ask all members of this House uh, to join me in thanking Dr. Young and all our health care professionals for everything that, that they do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kings West. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today to congratulate the West Kings uh, Wolverines on winning the Western Region Division II Girls Hockey Championship on the 28th of February in Yarmouth. The West Kings team went on to feed in the tournament, winning five games and capping off their perfect performance by shutting out the previously undefeated host, Yarmouth, 2-0 in the championship game, with Brooklyn Bishop and Leah Alder scoring for the Wolverines. West Kings will now move on to the provincial championships, which will be held at the Mariners Centre in Yarmouth from March 23rd to 25th. As a member of the Legislative Assembly for Kings West, I would like to congratulate the West Kings girls hockey team on their regional championship and wish them all the best for another successful performance in the upcoming provincial championship in Yarmouth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Colchester Muscadabit. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to commend the RCAF Association, Colchester Wing 102, and two of its members, all recipients of awards from the RCAF Association National Branch, in appreciation of service, hard work, and efforts within the association. On March 20th, Colchester Wing 102, chartered on June the 25th, 1949 will receive the Best Annual Report Award. Ralph Murphy will receive the association's third highest honor, the Meritorious Service Award, presented to six individuals annually for their involvement, activities, and dedication. Chris Henderson, the Wing's Public Relations Manager, will receive the Wing Bolton Award. The support that Colchester Wing 102 gives to Air Force veterans, air cadets, and Colchester communities is important and deserving of this recognition. So I offer congratulations to the Wing, Ralph Murphy, and Chris Henderson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Anna Ganish. Madam Speaker, Oliver Smith is a constituent of mine. He is 10 years old and has a rare form of bone cancer, Ewing sarcoma. One day, Oliver's dad, Brian, made him a wooden robot. They posted a picture of it on Facebook, and within that first night, they received 50 requests for what are now called Ollibots. Ollibots are essentially robots made out of wooden blocks and tied together with hockey laces. They come with googly eyes and a decal over the, uh, over the heart. Oliver's first Ollibot came with a Toronto Maple Leaf sticker, his favourite team. Ollibots now come with decals for just about any hockey team. Mr. Madam Speaker, Ollibots also come with a small heart inside a capital O. It appears on each robot over the area where a person's left hip would be, because this is the spot where Oliver's doctors found his cancer. Ollibots sell for $20 with proceeds going to the Ewing's, uh, Ewing's Cancer Foundation of Canada and to help other Nova Scotia families with travel costs if they need to travel to Halifax or farther for medical treatments. Madam Speaker, I'd like to take this moment to congratulate Oliver and his family for bringing awareness to Ewing's sarcoma through their Ollibots. And Order. Madam Speaker, Your time has elapsed. <laughs> I recognize the Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. March, of course, is Nutrition Month. Nutrition Month is a public campaign with the theme of unlocking potential food. The goal of the campaign is to provide information and guidance to assist Nova Scotians and Canadians to discover the potential of food and to improve their health and well-being. Dietitians help Nova Scotia and Canadians to realize the potential of food to fuel, discover, prevent, and heal as well as to bring us together. Madam Speaker, dietitians believe in the power of food to enhance lives and improve health. March 14th with Dietitian Day, and I rise today to acknowledge and thank all those from this profession. I recognize the Honourable Member for Preston Dartmouth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to recognize Viola Desmond as an African Nova Scotian woman who took a courageous stand against racism in 1946 and went to jail for it. Her crime was the setting of whites only section and she was charged with defrauding the province of one cent tax. As the injustice continues to be recognized, Ms. Desmond has been honored most recently for her image appearing on the new Canadian $10 bill. This latest honor makes her the first black non-rural woman to be memorialized on a Canadian currency in circulation. 
As a recent ceremony at Halifax Central Library, attended by the Federal Finance Minister and Bank of Canada Governor, Mrs. Desmond's sister, Wanda Robinson, revealed the design of the new $10 bill. Ms. Robinson stated, our family will go down in history, in history. Imagine that. I call on all members of this House to recognize the achievements of Iola Desmond in this ongoing struggle to eliminate racism in our province. I recognize the Honourable Member for Kings North. Madam Speaker, Canadian Geographic has chosen Steve Woolmouth from Central Kings Rural High School as their Geography Teacher of the Month. Mr. Woolmouth fell in love with geography at a young age and decided to become a teacher when he realized the subject came naturally to him. Five years ago, he expanded his teaching geography course to advanced placement human geography and geology. These classes are offered online after school so students from different schools can participate. In 2012-2013, he received the first ever provincial award for the teacher that makes a difference, which was based on nominations from students and their parents. Madam Speaker, I wish to congratulate Mr. Wilmoth on his dedication to his students. I recognize the honourable member for Hands East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, a devastating accident can either destroy or rally your spirit. A woman from Lance is an example of the latter. Shelley Bond suffered a tremendous injury in the baseball game in 2009. She moved back to Cape Breton to heal and recover from the trauma, returning to Lance again in 2016. Still suffering mentally from the injury which prevented her from returning to work in her health care field, she decided to follow her artistic passion and open a small gallery in Lance. The Earth and Bones Gallery speaks to her love of nature and to the healing that took place uh, of her shattered facial bones. Through the sale of her art, paint lessons, parties, art camps, and interaction at her studio, she provides not only just therapy for herself, but for anyone suffering from mental illness. I'd like to applaud and congratulate Shelley Bond for her initiative and resourcefulness in opening her gallery, Earth and Bones, which contributes to the well-being of all who visit. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge the late Vince Muse from Sydney River, who recently passed away at the age of 87. Vince Muse was a pure gentleman and a great community leader in sport and recreation, and his death is a sad loss to our community. The Cape Breton Sport Ho Heritage Hall of Fame twice recognized Vince's commitment to sport. As a builder in 2007 and again in 2016 as a member of the 1972 National Championship team. While most knew Vince for his commitment to local baseball, he also served his community in many other aspects throughout the years. All told, he coached Little League Baseball for 52 years. A recognition of, as recognition of his dedication, the home field of the Sydney River Cardinals became the Vince Muse Field in 1999. I am very proud, Madam Speaker, to have had the pleasure to have known Vince Muse. He will be sadly missed by many. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Madam Speaker, I would like to recognize a student from Dalhousie University who attended a skills competition in Windsor, Ontario for industrial and systems engineers. Florence Park, president of the Dalhousie chapter of the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers, won the national championship of the theoretical paper competition. Florence will now be heading to Orlando, Florida, where she will be moving forward with her paper and presenting it to an international panel from May 19th to 22nd. She will be representing Irving Shipbuilding, Dalhousie, and her province of Nova Scotia. Please join me in congratulating this spectacular student. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, last September I stood to congratulate Queen's County Sarah Mitten on her Canada Games gold medal and shot put. Well, it seems that this young woman is not done yet achieving excellence in her athletic career. On March 8th, Sarah was named U Sports Outstanding Female Field Performer. 
Sarah is a University of Windsor Lancer, is currently ranked number one in Canada in the shot put, and recently set another new personal best and a new Lancer record. Sarah's coach says that Sarah has been a key member in the success of her team this year. Her ability to be successful as a student athlete is a reflection of her ability to be organized and her strong work ethic. I ask all members to join me in congratulating Sarah. Sarah, you make Queen's County proud. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to honour the brave and dedicated supporters of the Dartmouth North Community Food Centre and Family Centre who, on this past St. Patrick's Day, shed their green outerwear and took a dip in the frigid Lake Bunuk to raise money for the Good Food Crusaders Blue Nose Marathon team. About 40 people in total, in two groups, rushed into the water and then back out to the waiting, their waiting towels and blankets, and then warmed up with some delicious chili inside the Bunuk Canoe Club. From the perspective of this less brave but no less dedicated supporter of the food centre and family centres, it truly looked like a lot of fun and I will do my level best to be there next year for a dip and that is enhanced. Uh, the, <laughs> the Good Food Crusaders will run or walk the 5k race at this year's Blue Nose Marathon and their goal is to raise $10,000 for the centre. I ask all members to congratulate the brave dippers and the good work being done for our community by everyone involved in the Dartmouth North Community Food Centre and the Dartmouth Family Centre. Thanks. I recognize the Honourable Member for Claire Digby. Thank you, Madam Speaker. During last year, there were many activities planned in our communities to celebrate Canada 150, from the big fireworks displays to smaller activities like the Canada Through the Ages Tea, hosted by the Women's Missionary Society of St. Mary's Baptist Church in Barton. The group decided that members serving tea would be dressed from the different eras of our first 150 years. People dropped in for a cup of tea, may have been served by a woman dressed in a floral lint dress from the time of Confederation or a flower power outfit from the 1960s. The group also displayed photographs from the area, needlework and jewelry. Some of these pieces have been passed down over several generations and are now treasured by their present owners. I would like to recognize the Women's Missionary Society and all the community groups who organize their unique Canada 150 celebrations. We tend to focus on the big events in Canada 150, but there's something quintessentially Canadian about going out for a cup of tea and learning about your community's history. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to commend Alex Cormier of Sydney Mines, author of the book Jump With Both Feet, the encouraging autism journey of a little boy named M. Her five-year-old son Emmett has autism and the book is designed about her personal journey as the parent of an autistic child. Alex believes the parents must always have hope and do not let go. The book offers tips, successes and challenges of the autism spectrum. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Alex for her insights and for her sharing how Emmett has taught her to live outside the box and colour outside the lines. I feel there will be other books as Emmett goes through life. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Guysborough Eastern Shore Trackity. Madam Speaker, there are some young farmers from the Manchester area of my riding that I would like to acknowledge today. Brothers Luke and Dylan Grant have recently taken over the McGurr family beef farm and newlyweds Melissa and Andrew Grace have begun farming chickens, pigs and vegetables on the Sullivan family land. Both are strong examples of the successful millennial business model of combining the valued knowledge of the past with the sustainable food movement of the future. And both are doing a commendable job of creating quality product that is quickly filling a need in this growing market. The framework of this province was built on family farms, just like the Sullivans and McGurs, and it is very encouraging to see our youth taking this initiative to turn over the soil, if you will, and continue the long-held traditions of rural Nova Scotia. Madam Speaker, farm life is not for the meek. It requires vigorous schedules, physical and mental resiliency, and a strong will to thrive, even when the weather isn't playing fair. In the best of times, it is still an immense undertaking. I want these and all young farmers to know that they are deeply appreciated for their strong contributions to their local community and to the farming community province-wide. Time has really elapsed. <laughs> I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton-Richmond. 
Madam Speaker, the 20th edition of the Rendezvous de la Francophonie offers a variety of activities, contests and blogs interesting young and old from across the country. Celebrations began on March 1st and end on March 21st. Today, March 20th, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, I beg your pardon, is International Day of la Francophonie. Madam Speaker, more than 3,000 activities are taking place across the country. In Cape Breton, Richmond, there are three activities, in particular, where the French language and culture are promoted. Alpha Communo Je parle français avec mon enfant et littératique numérique. I am proud of my community as well as all communities across this province who have protected the French language and culture, especially Centre La Picasse et École Beauport. There is nothing more beautiful and magical than living in a community where I can hear, still hear the language spoken by my ancestors. I wish you a wonderful International Day de la Francophonie. Madame la Présidente, pour le 20e édition, les rendez-vous de la francophonie proposent une panoplie d'activités, de concours et de blogs intéressant les jeunes et moins jeunes de partout au pays. Les, les événements sont commencés le 1er mars et finis demain le 21 mars. Aujourd'hui, c'est la journée internationale de la francophonie. Madame la Présidente, pendant cette période, plus de 3000 activités ont lieu autour du pays. Dans ma communauté, il y a trois activités, en particulier où la langue et la culture française est promue, Alpha communautaire, je parle français avec mon enfant, et littératie numérique. Je suis fière de ma communauté et euh, qui a travaillé pour protéger notre langue et culture française. Je félicite les organisations et les communautés de la Provence qui continuent de promouvoir notre langue et notre culture comme la PICAS, Centre communautaire culturel et École Beauport. Il n'y a rien de plus beau que de vivre dans une communauté où je peux encore entendre ma langue parlée par mes ancêtres. Je vous souhaite une bonne journée internationale de la francophonie. I recognize the Honorable Member for Halifax, Armdale. Uh, Madam Speaker, today I stand to recognize an outstanding individual and a resident of Halifax, Armdale, Melvin Bootlier. It was with great pride that in January I attended St. Mary's University Winter Convocation where Mel was awarded an honorary doctorate of civil law and joined the community of Santa Marians. Mel rose from poverty in his childhood to a long and successful career. After retirement, he founded the Parker Street Food Bank and more recently the Metro Care and Share Society. Mel's contributions to our city and to people's lives are simply impossible to measure. In his remarks, he joked with the graduates that it took him only 34 years to receive his honorary degree, but that it felt like it was only yesterday that he retired and began his work in philanthropy and social enterprise. Please join me in congratulating Mel on this well-deserved recognition and wishing him a happy 90th birthday. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Madam Speaker, I would like to recognize Noreen Smiley and her volunteers from the Pugwash Farmers Market. They are receiving funding to help improve their facilities with new kiosks that will attract new vendors and new commerce. Farmers markets attract local, seasonal and many tourists to the village. With the updated facilities, the farmers market will be able to draw in more business and is an important part of Pugwash's business community. Noreen and her volunteers see the importance of this farmer's market and have worked hard to make it an important part of Pugwash's culture and economy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to recognize Lorna Zink Gordon of Upper Tan Town. Lorna is a warm and giving lady who volunteers for many good causes in the community. In the spring of 2017, Lorna tragically lost her husband, Ken, leaving the family devastated. A year later, as her family tries to heal from her sad loss, Lorna is once again thinking of others. After losing Ken, Lorna realized that her community did not have the benefit of a grief support group for families in similar situations, so she started one. She reached out to recruit people with expertise in counselling and spread the word in a local area to form a free grief support group that meets every Friday at the Esther Brooks Community Hall. I would like the members of this Nova Scotia Host of Assembly to join me in thanking Lorna for her generosity of spirit and her ability to step up even in the face of adversity to lead by example. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Courtney Malcolm, an excellent local hockey star from Pictou County, 
was at a New York Rangers training camp when his promising hockey career came to a sudden end at the age of 21. During one of the drills, his skate blade caught something and he slid into the goal post, injuring his right leg. Unfortunately, what appeared to be the beginning of a great career ended during that drill. Malcolm entered the coaching ranks and quickly became a big success, taking teams to provincial championships, often arriving home in the gold medal. He often thinks about his junior hockey career in Quebec, playing with future stars like John Bellabo, Boom Boom Jeffreyon, and Dickie Moore. One can only imagine the career this very talented athlete could have had if not for a freak accident during an NHL training camp. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Fairview Clayton Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to recognize the Armdale Fairview Rockingham Lions Club for their efforts in raising monies this year for the Terry Fox Foundation. This past September, the club hosted their road toll, collecting donations from community members to support an amazing cause. This initiative was spearheaded by Vice President Larry Kennedy, who presented Provincial Director of the Foundation, Barbara Pat, with the check the following month. In over 15 years, the Armdale Fairview Rockingham Lions Club has raised nearly $24,000 for the Terry Fox Foundation. We are proud to have such a dedicated group of individuals in our community to help those in need. Madam Speaker, I ask that the members of this house join me in thanking the Armdale Fairview Rockingham Lions Club for their tremendous dedication to such a wonderful cause. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. As MLAs, we know the importance of photographs. A photograph can be used as a weapon, it can be used to make a point, and more importantly, it can be used to hold a memory. With the amount of advertising that we put our faces on, I know all MLAs are grateful for the photographers who have helped us. That is why today I honour Dartmouth East resident Rick Moore. Rick is using his camera and his art to bring joy to the lives of those around him. Rick is a portrait, landscape and lifestyle photographer whose approach is to capture stories through his photography. It is an honour to thank Rick for his beautiful photographs and I ask all members of this house to thank Rick for sharing his talent with our community. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Congratulations to Dartmouth High girls and the Moncton boys basketball teams on their recent win at the 8th annual Bill Dompierre Memorial uh, Tournament. This annual tournament takes place at Lockview High School and features 12 high schools, boys and girls teams for, from across Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Lockview High hosts the tournament to honour an incredible man, Dom Pierre, and to help raise money for the Kidney Cancer Canada. Bill started coaching basketball with uh, Bedford Minor Basketball and then moved on to coach the C.P. Allen and Lockview High and finally Dartmouth High. Monies raised to this uh, supports uh, uh, Kidney Cancer Canada. Please join me in thanking Lockview High basketball volunteers for their continued support on this great cause. Thank you, Madam Good Speaker. Job. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, Madam Speaker, on February 5th, the Mobile Food Market received a, civil a silver medal in the IPAC Deloitte Public Sector Leadership Award. The market received this national recognition for the innovative and collaborative approach to addressing food insecurity. The mobile food market began a couple years ago and provides fresh fruit and vegetables to communities at a reasonable price. A converted Metro Transit bus is used to bring the market to several communities in HRM bi-weekly. This project was made possible through the collaboration of municipality and provincial government and many nonprofit organizations. Initially, the market stopped at the Spryfield Lions Rink, but this service has been expanded to include a stop in Harrietsfield and two additional stops in Spryfield. During the winter month, the bus does not run, uh, but product packs are available bi-weekly throughout the Spryfield surrounding area. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to congratulate the mobile food market on receiving this prestigious recognition. Their unique uh, approach to providing fresh fruit and vegetables to underserved communities has been a huge success. I'd also like to extend a special Order. thank you. Time has elapsed. <laughs> I recognize the Honourable Member for Colchester Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to congratulate 16 post-secondary students who have received the Pengrove Nova Scotia Energy Scholarship. 
These energy scholarships are awarded to candidates who pursue post-secondary studies in an energy-related field. One of these recipients is Cole, South Colchester Academy graduate Luke McMillan, who is pursuing a Bachelor of Engineering degree at Dalhousie University. Luke had said that the scholarship of $2,500 per year for four years has raised his academic confidence and reduced the stress associated with being a student. M Madam Speaker, this is a wonderful example of investing in our youth and our future, and I again would like to congratulate and commend the efforts of Luke McMillan and the other Penn Growth Nova Scotia scholarship recipients. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In 2003, the St. Margaret's Bay Stewardship Association was established to safeguard the natural beauty and enhance the quality of life in the St. Margaret's Bay area. The association acts as a spokesperson and facilitator for Bay Area residents on a wide range of environmental challenges. They're involved in coastal stewardship as well as celebrating the Bay's history, culture and festivals. The volunteer organization's members are drawn from communities all around beautiful St. Margaret's Bay, from East Dover to the Aspatogan Peninsula. The association supports development that is sustainable, environmentally sensitive and respectful of community values. The association approaches each development as unique and is committed to working with government and the developers to ensure the acknowledgement of residents' concerns and reach consensus. I ask the members of the House to join me in congratulating the St. Margaret's Bay Stewardship Association in their important work to date and to wish them well in their future endeavours. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, everybody wants to beat cancer, but not everybody knows how to do it. Well, you hurry hard to participate in the Pictou's Curl for Cancer, which was held on February 23, 2018, to show support. A total of $19,115 was raised by dedicated, compassionate, and determined community-minded folks. With the addition of $16,000 raised in Westville, the total now stands at more than $35,000. West Surrette and his Picto Lodge Beach and Resort were the top fundraising team coming in at over $1,300 at this year's bond spiel, which is an impressive total for one team and a great incentive to challenge for fundraising for next year. We owe a big thank you to all the volunteers and donors who made this year's event a huge success. This is a true testament to the unity of the people from Picto County. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Madam Speaker, I would like to congratulate Mike Wyatt on his recent appointment as Director of Soccer Development for Soccer Nova Scotia. Mike will be responsible for overseeing the technical department of Soccer Nova Scotia, including support for the grassroots development officer, high performance manager, and the regional technical directors located across the province. He will also represent Nova Scotia as a na at the national level sitting on, uh, on the Canada Soccer Technical Committee. Most interestingly, Mike will, will teach coach educators about the child development theories as they relate to their coaching duties. Mike will be located at the BMO Soccer Centre in Clayton Park West. Madam Speaker, I would like to congratulate Mike on his opportunity. There is no doubt that the sport will benefit from his expertise and experience. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Kings North. Madam Speaker, another Kenful resident, Mike Schroeder, will be representing our town on the upcoming season of Master Chef Canada. Mr. Schroeder says he's inspired by places he's visited and showcases that in his food. His father was a cook for the Army and he says his grandmother's house was always full of fresh food. This combined with living coast to coast has influenced his unique cooking style. He chose smoked wild boar with rosemary butter and Tuscan salad with citrus dressing for his audition meal. Mr. Speaker, I would like to wish Mike Schroeder the best of luck as he represents not only Nova Scotia, but Kempville on the television show Master Chef of Canada. I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize King South writer Daphne Gertrude Frazee. Daphne is the author of three books. The first two are 
capture the vibrant past of the Gaspro Valley area, and the third details the impressive career of her grandfather, Charles Wright, who partnered with R.A. Jodry in establishing Minus Basin Pulp and Power Company and pioneered the building of power plants in the area. Daphne also created a monthly magazine, the Gaspro Valley Gazette, to help enhance the sense of community in the Gaspro Valley area. This important publication celebrated its 10th anniversary in 2017. I invite all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Daphne Gertrude Frazzi on her successful writing career thus far and thanking her for her deep commitment to the history and culture of her community. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I rise to recognize Ms. Jessica Dupuy, a teacher of an Aboriginal support worker at Millwood High School in Middle Sackville, Nova Scotia, as well as the Aboriginal graduating students of the class of 2017. Madam Speaker, 10% of Millwood High School's student population is Indigenous, and Mrs. Dupuy's wanted to mark the achievement of the Indigenous members of the last year's graduating class. Mrs. Dupuy decided to make medicine bags for students as a way to make them feel recognized and encourage them to further explore their Aboriginal heritage. The medicine bags she crafted are made of deer hide and contain sacred medicines such as sweet grass and sage. The medicine bag, of course, is a long-standing Aboriginal tradition. It represents wisdom, spirituality, and connection to the Creator. Madam Speaker, in a nation where more than 50% of First Nations young adults aged 20 to 24 have not completed high school, Mrs. Dupuy's acknowledgement of her students' accomplishments is well placed, and I ask that we recognize both Mrs. Dupuy's as well as those hardworking and dedicated students at Millwood High. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Kings West. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to offer congratulations to Justin Kennedy of Aylesford for placing first in the U-12 male category at the Cranberry Cup Ski Cross event held at Martok on February 18. The 2018 Cranberry Cup hosted by the Martok Ski Club brought approximately 125 competitors from the Atlantic region together for the annual racing event. The athletes who competed during the race weekend ranges from the age of 5 to 11. Just, uh, Madam Speaker, on behalf of the province of Nova Scotia, I would like to congratulate Justin Kennedy, a race competitor, a member of the Martok Ski Race Club, on his victory at the Cranberry Cup and wish him all the best in his sporting career. Furthermore, I would like to thank the event sponsors and volunteers for their efforts and their support to facilitate a successful race each season. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to congratulate a group of Special Olympians from Queen's County who will represent Nova Scotia at the 2018 Canada Summer Games being held this July and August. These five athletes will each compete in three events, Rebecca Mall in the shot put, plus the 100 and 200 metres, Rebecca Delaney in the standing long jump and the 100 and 200 metres, Colby Oikel in the shot put, 100 and 200 meters and Ben Terrio and Jamie Belong will both compete in the 100, 200 and 400 meters. Madam Speaker, I congratulate all five for their dedication to sport and for being chosen to represent Nova Scotia at this national event. We send them wishes for enjoyment and success in Antigonish. Thank you, Mr. Sp or Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Antigonish. Madam Speaker, Ben Berthium is an, Ant an Antikinish native who, like most uh, Antikinishers, has a love for hockey. His love and commitment to the sport has earned him the title of the 2018 Atlantic University Sport Women's Hockey Coach of the Year. Madam Speaker, Ben is the head coach of the St. of X X women's hockey team. He's been with the team for 14 years, first as an assistant coach and stepping into the role of interim head coach in 2014. That year, he led the team to an AUS championship. It's worth noting, Madam Speaker, at the time, Ben was also a full-time student at St. of X, finishing his Master of Education degree in Leadership and Administration. Madam Speaker, Ben was named head coach of the X women hockey team in 2017, a title I would say is well earned, having been with the program for so many years. Madam Speaker, I'd like to offer my congratulations to Mr. Berthium for being named the AUS Women's Hockey Coach of the Year. Thank you. I, rec 
I recognize the honourable member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction before my statement. Granted. Uh, I just want to draw the attention to the gallery opposite today where I have my son who arrived today uh, in search of some employment opportunities but wanted to take in question period, so he decided to drop down and watch the proceedings today, so I'd like to have everybody give him a warm welcome. <laughs> Mr. Madam Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Wanda Robson on the success of her book, Sister to Courage, Stories from the World of Viola Desmond. Ron Kaplan assisted Wanda with her book about her sister, the civil rights leader, who was arrested in 1946 for sitting in the whites-only section of the Roseland Theatre in New Glasgow. Wanda's book and Viola's life have brought many honours to Viola. A stamp with her likeness, a Halifax Dartmouth Ferry has been named after her, and now she will appear on the new Canadian $10 bill. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Viola and her, and her courage to generate change, and also Wanda Robson, who let us know about her sister through her book. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Preston Dermot. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize the new pre-primary class announcer, Humber Park, and Ross Road Elementary Schools in my area. These programs will assist the children in transitioning to the school system and provide them with child-centered experience that will enable them best start possible and success as they begin their education. Pre-primary program is an important step in a child's education will serve all children and will provide an enriched experience for children and families that may not have been able to attend other early learning and childhood care programs. I'm excited for these children and families as a pre-primary program will prepare them for children to go to school. I applaud and congratulate the families of Humber Park and Ross Road Elementary School on achieving and welcoming this new primary program on their schools and their community. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, today I'd like to recognize Vicki Daly of Amherst. She is the recent recipient of the Amherst Rotary Club's Community Fellowship Award. This is presented to a non-Rotarian for their work in the community. Vicki is the driving force behind the Cumberland Health Authority, or sorry, the Cumberland Health Auxiliary, the Highland Fling, and many other organizations in our community. She is simply an amazing woman. Volunteers are an important part to our community, and having people like Vicki Daly, who are so involved, keep our community growing and strong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Claire Digby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to recognize the efforts of Chris Murdoch and Carol Dibble of the Bear River Community Greenhouse and Waterfront Gardens. The greenhouse part of the solar aquatic treatment plant was decommissioned in 2012 and was slated to be tore down. Chris and Carol proposed an alternative project to the municipality and renovated the greenhouse to design a waterfront garden instead. In addition to getting their support of the municipality, the project captured the imagination of the people of their community. The group also reserved one plot for people who could not have finances to buy fresh products, or the physical ability or mobility to work in the greenhouse or the gardens and another for the Bear River First Nation. This is such a great project that opened the novel community meeting place as well and revitalized the waterfront of Bear River. For the people of Bear River, it quickly became a meeting place where they can get a bit of exercise, tend their crops and grow their own fresh produce over the summer and fall months. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Guysboro Eastern Shore, Trackety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in recognition of the Henley House Pub and Restaurant in Cheat Harbour. Built in 1916 by Roy R.B. and Loretta Henley, it served as an inn, a general store, an insurance office, and family home for three generations of Henleys. Dr. Brad Atkinson and his wife Merrill purchased the home in 2008 and with love and respect have fully renovated it, lining the halls with authentic family photos and many artifacts from the original RB's general store and the East Inn. Mr. Speaker, Brad and Merrill built a wonderful small business around the history of this beloved local treasure. The Henley House Pub and Restaurant <clears throat> showcase local music, offer a delicious menu, and provide a cultural experience rich with East Coast traditions and heritage, and for that I commend them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax-Armdale. 
Mr. Speaker, I rise today to express a sincere thank you to the three teachers who chaperoned 27 high school students last week in the 2018 European trip. Mr. Andrew McIntosh, Ms. Jennifer Smith, and Ms. Victoria Best for creating an everlasting memorable experience for the 27 students as well as their parents, putting their mind at ease throughout the whole eight days. The children enjoyed very much all the sightseeing events in Paris with the guided tours. They saw the Arc de Triomphe, Champs-Élysées, Eiffel Tower, uh, and so many places. Also visited the famous uh, Vimy Ridge and paid tribute to the veterans there and also Barcelona, Spain. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to recognize L Dance Academy of Beachville, owned by Lindsay Fraser. L Dance Academy offers a variety of classes and programs to suit dancers at any age and level. Through the recreational dance program, students learn the basics of dance technique and perform in a year-end recital. The recreational dance program is often where dancers begin their training and eventually move on to dance competitively. The competitive dancers at L Dance Academy train a minimum of five hours a week. These dancers are required to take a daily, a weekly ballet class on top of their choreographic classes where they learn and rehearse routines for competition. In the competitive dance program, the dancers compete at several competitions in the spring and also perform in the year-end recital. I would like the members of the House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Lindsay Fraser and L Dance Academy on their successful business and for encouraging so many young people to live an active lifestyle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize Sid Shedra, a recipient of the Halifax West Sesquicentennial Award. In honour of Canada 150, Sid was honoured along with several others with the distinction of this award. Mr. Shedra has accomplished many things, including founding the Atlantic Convenience Stores Association and is also a founding member of the Canadian Lebanese Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He is an active member of the Freemasons, Shriners, the Canadian Lebanon Society and Demand Association Canada. Mr. Speaker, I ask the members of this House to join me in congratulating Sid in being awarded this esteemed award. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Oh, no. Uh, the Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaverbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud of my community and the continued support of the Lions Christmas Express. The Lions Club, local businesses, schools, churches, and volunteers work together to ensure the members of the community are cared for. The uh, local food drive is supported by our schools as well as those attending the Lions Christmas Express Parade. Many local businesses organized food, toys, clothes, and donation drives. Community groups collected warm hats and mittens, raffled off baskets, and volunteered their time. They sorted, packed, and delivered the food and gifts. In total, 105 local families were able to enjoy Christmas with the donations from the community. Please join me in thanking everyone who supported the Christmas Express and definitely is a team effort. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the annual Spryfield Business Commission Festival a Dinner uh, not only brought local businesses together to celebrate, it also honoured four outstanding volunteers from the Spryfield area. This year's recipients were Donna Fleming, Gina Gray, Eric Keynes and Darlene Burbridge. Uh, Donna Fleming was recognized for her role as the chair of the Long Lake Provincial Park Association. Gina Gray was recognized for her involvement with the Santa, Spryfield Santa Claus Parade, acting as co-chair and parade marshal. Eric Keynes is a tireless volunteer in the community, acting as treasurer for the Spryfield Business Community and the Long Lake Provincial Park Association. Eric also coaches Shabakto minor, minor Hockey. Uh, Darlene Burbridge was recognized for her role as co-chair of the Spryfield Harvest Festival. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to congratulate Donna, Gina, Eric and Darlene for their outstanding community services. They all have made huge contributions to Spryfield and the surrounding communities. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's with 30 Thank you, Mr. seconds. Speaker. I rise today to salute my alma mater, Dalhousie University, on the dawn of its third century. We, the alumni, are proud to be part of one of Canada's first and finest universities and to mark 200 years of contribution to our province, to our country, and to our world. 2018 is a year 
for us to reflect on all that has made Dalhousie a Canadian educator leader and a research powerhouse. It's also a time for us to deliberate on what's ahead, a new and unprecedented era for Dalhousie to chart new paths and extend the boundaries of knowledge Order, please. The time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members. The honourable member for... The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. My apologies. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, for years, budget after budget from this government, we have been trying to make the government understand that we are in a mental health crisis. It's systemic. And it's an onslaught of tragic personal stories of struggle and loss, Mr. Speaker. This year's budget allocates $2.9 million to mental health services. And for what? And I quote from the release today. It's for community-based mental health supports to help those areas without quick access to outpatient clinics. This government's own website shows that wait times range between 45 days and a shameful 363 days. So I asked the Premier, can he please indicate which part of Nova Scotia currently does have quick access to outpatient clinics for mental health care? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the honourable member for the question. Mr. Speaker, I want to clarify uh, some of her comments. Mr. Speaker, there's actually an increase in uh, the overall budgets around mental health. I want to tell her the overall mental health in the Department of Health, uh, Department of Health, has gone from uh, 281 million, Mr. Speaker, to 287 million. The youth centres that are across our province, we, which we've seen great results, have gone from two to three million, Mr. Speaker. We've seen the School Plus programs increase from 8.2 million to 9.8 million, where we're seeing very positive stuff. And Mr. Speaker, I would. Probably envision there's st stuff coming in and around when we're dealing with the whole issues close to uh, uh, the inclusion report that we'll hear from, and of course, announce the first project uh, dealing with those issues at the universities, which is a half a million dollars, which is a total of $8.6 million to bring our grand total, the issues on mental health, to over $300 million. The Honourable, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Premier for the answer. It was a question that was directly asked by those from the uh, Finance Department today, but in the past fiscal year, this government underspent its budget to pay clinicians mm -hmm. by $4 million, and this just wasn't for doctors, right? And it's difficult to celebrate the 2.9 or whatever number um, that the government is throwing out when we don't have a plan. We don't have a plan. In fact, I believe that the number that they're investing in mental health might be even less than what they <laughs> uh, invested in the rink in Windsor. So my question, with communities losing psychiatrists, with people in a crisis being sent home from emergency rooms to wait the weekend, will the Premier please explain why the mental health of Nova Scotians is such a low priority in this budget? The Honourable Premier. Thank uh, the Honourable for question. I completely disagree with her premise on the whole issue, Mr. Speaker. As you tell, uh, through a number of departments, we've worked continue to increase uh, in excess of $8 million in addition to almost $300 million to address the issue. She's very right when she talked about hiring clinicians. It's been a challenge to hire psychiatrists. I'm very proud of the work we were doing with Doctors Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. That was part of the announcement uh, a few days ago, and I look forward to continuing to monitor and hear with the Minister of Health and the great work he's doing with psychiatrists across this province so that we continue to make sure we've health care providers broad as much as we but let me be clear, Mr. Speaker, there's not one simple answer. That's why we've built a wraparound approach and we'll continue to do so with all of our partners to deliver uh, mental health services to the citizens. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on her final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It seems like this government is downloading its responsibility for mental health services to community support groups. We're seeing it in Pictou County. We don't have a psychiatrist, and I guess this way, um, perhaps they will have someone else to blame for this broken That's system. Right. Uh, so I'm going to ask a straightforward, simple question. Is the Premier intending to put any more of the work of Department of Health and Wellness or Health Authority on the backs of community <coughs> supports and 1-800 numbers without the system support they need. The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Spurk. I'm very proud of the work we've been able to do with our partners across the province, continue to improve services uh, to the citizens uh, of this great province. Mr. Speaker, we know there's more work to do. We believe that we do that by including all Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, those who have specialties to help us deliver that service, and we're going to continue to work with those in community. The Conservatives 
may not think that partners in the community have any role to play. We believe partnering with them will continue to work with that. This investment makes uh, makes continue increase. And as again, as I said, the Minister of Health is working with our partners to ensure that we continue to hire more clinicians across this province to continue to provide those services in the communities where Nova Scotians need them. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the government today has brought in a budget which does not provide for the opening of a single new nursing home bed anywhere in our province. Uh, this has come at a time when we know that there are hundreds of thousands of patient bed days in our province's hospitals uh, where the bed is being occupied by people who are not hospital patients at all. But nursing home candidates who are waiting for a placement when there is no placement there for them. Uh, so Mr. Speaker, I, I want to ask the Premier what possible account can he offer of, for himself as an explanation for this decision? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank uh, the gentleman for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as, I, uh, as he would know, under the first mandate of our government, we continue to reduce that wait list by over 50 per cent. We've heard from seniors in the province who want to make sure they can stay home and receive that service at home. It's why we've invested again in this particular budget in providing the home care services. The investment we're making to broaden the caregiver's allowance is providing uh, for family members to care for people at home where their loved ones want to be, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to work with our partners, and if it requires long-term care beds, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to build that in the capital plan as we move forward. Uh, but we will continue to work with the hospitals to ensure that the very issue the Honourable Member is talking about gets addressed. The list he refers to uh, takes in a lot of Nova Scotia, not just those, quite frankly, who are looking for long-term care. The list he's referring to is palliative care, people who can't try to transition home immediately today. They're not looking for nursing home beds, Mr. Speaker. They're looking for loved ones to be able to look for them at home. Those are all of the numbers that he has built around this. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, clouds the debate on the reality of what we really need in the system, and it's not helpful to find the common solution that we all believe we deserve. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. M Mr. Speaker, the preponderant majority of the people in the category of whom I'm speaking uh, are people uh, who, living in a, in a hospital uh, in the province while they're waiting for nursing home placement, uh, are in possession of a professional care assessment which says that they are at a point in life when they cannot return to their homes. So to refer to this problem and to these people from the point of view, the perspective of home care is a, a quad quadruple red herring and a ridiculous irrelevancy. And so, I, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to ask the Premier, what does he say to the hundreds of people who are in our province waiting every day for the call to come uh, from a nursing home so that they can make that transition that they're looking forward to, a call which is going to be that much delayed by the decision not to open any new nursing home beds in this budget. The Honourable Premier. Again, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Uh, the reality of it, Mr. Speaker, we've continued to reduce the wait list that grew under his government, Mr. Party. Mr. Speaker, we've continued to reduce by 50 per cent. The list that he's referring to, Mr. Mr. Speaker, as on the people who are looking for palliative care, we're investing in hospitals across the province. We're continuing to make sure we have those palliative care positions. We also know, in some cases, people on that list who want to transition to home need those supports in and around them. Mr. Speaker, we're helping to transition them back to home. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with the investments we're making, and we'll continue to look at the, with our partners on whether or not we require more long-term care beds into the future. But the reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, we're responding to the needs that we hear from Nova Scotians and the way that Nova Scotians want us to respond to them. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Not only has the government failed to open a single new nursing home bid in this budget, they've also actively failed to replace the funds that they have taken away from the operating finances of nursing homes in the provinces over the last two years, which amounts to around $4 million. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier what possible justification uh, can he have for not only failing to open any new nursing home beds, but for also failing to put back the money that he has taken away from the nursing home beds we've got. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, we had this debate last year, Mr. Speaker. What we did, was, Mr. Speaker, is uh, rationalize the administration part of delivering long-term care. We replaced funding back into uh, those uh, nursing homes across the province to continue to make sure that we provide those services. I, maybe one of his own colleagues wants to answer the question for him, Mr. Speaker. I think if they want to know... Order, please. The, the Honourable Premier has the floor. Mr. Speaker, they couldn't answer when they were in government, so now all of a sudden they get smart. Order, the reality please. Is, the Honourable Premier has the floor. 
Mr. Speaker, the reality of it is we had this debate last year when it came to the administration costs of long-term care facilities. We reduced that. Some of that money has gone back into the food budget and occupational health and safety to respond to the needs of the patients, Mr. Speaker, for our, for our loved ones who are in long-term care facilities. We're continuing to work with our partners to ensure that, that those Nova Scotians who require long-term care get it and those Nova Scotians that want to live uh, the remaining years of their uh, life at home to make sure that we have resources and programs in place to allow them to do so. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Premier. Ready or not, sometime this year, uh, we are going to be selling recreational cannabis. And this budget anticipates gaining more than $20 million in new taxes from cannabis, but warns it will cost at least that much to sell it. It's a guesstimate with a flexibility in the model. Since this government has chosen to ignore the recommendations for keeping cannabis out of the hands of those under 25 or the strong recommendation not to sell it along with alcohol, it begs a very important question. Why is there no money or programming in this budget to educate or reduce harm to Nova Scotians? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Madam Speaker, there are budgets across that we have invested, not only in the issues she's talking about, education, there's funding around policing, community safety. The reality of it is uh, we had to identify through the best uh, information we had to put a, a number item around, around the revenue. We built those budgets in our departments who are responsible. The Minister of Justice will be dealing with the issues around policing and the issues around safer communities. The Minister of Health will be dealing with some of those issues. And we'll also, as a broader government, be looking at how do we communicate to make sure that we build on the stuff that's happening at the national level. So we built into our assumptions, Mr. Speaker, that we'll be able to address the issues that will be part of this. Uh, but I want to be clear. Uh, we've said all along that all the costs borne associated with this will fall back on every provincial government across the country, and we're still negotiating with the national government to ensure they cover their share of these expenses. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would like to see that table because a week ago or two, we asked the question about how much money would be coming for this such a thing, and there was none at that point in time. So on this side of the House, we have been asking for a plan. We've been asking for something beyond a possible list of locations to sell cannabis, and this budget has nothing beyond a sales plan. The budget certainly doesn't factor in the human costs associated with the use of cannabis. So given the connection between cannabis and mental health crisis such as anxiety and panic attacks and schizophrenia, how can this government even consider working out the sales and then dealing with the fallout later? The Honourable Premier. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, she is right. That's why we have a budget, Mr. Speaker. We lay out the budget uh, in, in this process. She'll get a chance to look at the entire budget as it goes forward. Not only the uh, revenue that's coming in from uh, the sale of marijuana, but the other stuff associated with it, the other costs we appreciated. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, we had to put a line out when it came to revenue. What was the best assumptions we had that was presented to us? We looked at. That's the number we came up with. And we built into our departments as we continue to look forward about how do we build the costs associated with delivering this product to our citizens. We're working with our partners, whether it's municipal or federal police force, on the costs associated, ensuring they get the right devices in their system, training requirements that's going to be there. We're building into our assumptions in the Department of Justice. We're looking at the social costs that we come into our system. We're working with the Minister of Health uh, to how do we address those across departments mental issues, Mr. Speaker, and, and let me assure the Honourable Member, like everything else in this budget, Mr. Speaker, we've covered the assumptions associated and we'll continue to live, deliver good, positive, forward-thinking government to the citizens of this great province. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, by, by not opening a, a single new nursing home bed through this budget anywhere across the province, the government is having a, a severely negative impact on patient flow in the hospitals of the province. Across Nova Scotia, we have paramedics waiting 8, 10, 12, 14 hours uh, to be able to offload patients because there is no room uh, in the hospitals. Uh, we have patients who are being cared for on stretchers in hallways and corridors and in the alcove by the ice machine and Lord knows where because there's no room in the hospital. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier, does he not see the negative impact on the uh, efficiency and the quality of care in our hospitals that is going to flow from this negative decision not to open a single nursing home bed in this, with this budget. The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. In that long, uh, drawn-out preamble coming into the question, the reality one of the issues that he brought into that, Mr. Speaker, is the whole HIV, HS is being stopped in health care facilities is a real issue. 
It's one we need to address. The issue that he speaks about of long-term care patients, Mr. Speaker, he's equating that to the reason the ambulances are there. We don't necessarily agree with his vision of that or his rationale for that. What we do know, there is a challenge associated with EHS and ambulances being too long in hospitals. We're going to work with our partner to ensure that that transition, that, that handoff from highly qualified paramedics and the rigs that they operate in, that happens to our health care providers so that we can transition back into ensuring that our highly qualified paramedics are out being able to respond to calls in the community. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, here's a short preamble. The decision to not open a single new nursing home bed in our province is a disappointment and a letdown and a sadness to the people of Nova Scotia. And there, therefore, I want to ask the Premier, what else of the, are the people of our province to think but that he and his government at some level are failing to see or understand or grasp the depth of the health care crisis as we see it and experience it in the number of the people of our province who are living in hospitals because there's no place for them in a nursing home. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question coming from the Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, I disagree with the entire premise as he's laying it out. Mr. Speaker, we continue to invest where Nova Scotians have told us they wanted us to do. Uh, Nova Scotians have told us they wanted to remain in their home as long as possible. We continue to make that. We've reduced the wait list for long-term care by over 50 per cent. We're going to continue to work with families who are caring for loved ones, who loved one wants to be at home for as long as possible. We've done that by broadening the caregiver's allowance. We're continuing to work with them and our partners. And as I said to the Honourable Member, my first question, we'll continue to watch what's happening around long-term care uh, facilities. But the issue that he's using to analyze and equate why we need more long-term care is it's just not accurate, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, I beg to differ that we are not putting, this government is not putting the money where the people of Nova Scotia want it. And psychiatry is a perfect example. Mr. Speaker, Picto has no psychiatrist. Cape Breton has very few. People can't get access to care. And one of the reasons is the college changed the licensing laws, and I brought this up last fall to the Minister of Health. Can he please tell us today where in the budget is money to help define licensed physicians provide academic support for them so they can pass their exams and stay in practice here in this province. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the uh, work uh, within uh, the Department of Health as well as the uh, partners with the Nova Scotia Health Authority, Mr. Speaker, uh, work with our physicians through a variety of, of programs to support uh, their needs and professional developments, Mr. Speaker, uh, as well as funding within uh, their own professional body with Doctors Nova Scotia. So there are uh, a variety of, uh, of, of opportunities, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, the funding's uh, available for programs that we have. Uh, and. Uh, we invest heavily in a number of other programs uh, expanding in this year's budget. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, there is actually no funding for defined licensed physicians in this province. So while, while our government is bragging that they're over in the UK recruiting new physicians, they're leaving faster than they can be recruited because these defined licensed doctors are coming here with no academic support and they're expected to pass Royal College exams with no academic support while working full-time. Can the Minister of Health please tell us again, where in the budget is there money to help bring in psychiatrists, support them to practice here in Nova Scotia, and reduce the risks of suicide in people with mental health crisis in our province? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for, for the question. Uh, obviously, as we've uh, discussed several times, the um, efforts to recruit and uh, expand uh, access to uh, mental health clinicians, including psychiatrists, uh, throughout the province, Mr. Speaker, is ongoing. The budget money is there uh, to fund these positions, Mr. Speaker. I want to assure all Nova Scotians that, that is the case. Uh, the efforts that we've uh, highlighted with respect to and in partnership with my colleague and the Department of Immigration, Mr. Speaker, uh, recruiting is targeted preliminary in in areas that don't require defined licenses, Mr. Speaker, but those individuals can come into Nova Scotia and practice with a full license, Mr. Speaker. That's why we've targeted those areas like the UK and the US that already receive uh, full license recognition, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question for the Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we had two budgets tabled last year, one in the spring and one in the fall. And when the fall budget was tabled, we noted that the estimate for personal income tax revenue 
uh, had reduced from, by $30 million between the spring and the fall budgets. And today we learned that even that reduced number was still too high. There was a further reduction over $140 million. Mr. Speaker, this is a key indicator of uh, personal income generation. And a slowdown in personal income generation that taxes are paying is not a good sign for the economy. So I'd like to ask the minister, can the minister explain why the province has seen what has amounted to a $175 million reduction in personal income tax revenues over the past year. Why, why has that happened and what does that say about our economy? The Honourable Minister of Finance. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the uh, member refers to the, uh, I believe, the December forecast, uh, the September budget and the December forecast. Uh, the same with our final forecast, which we tabled today. All of those numbers are based on uh, assumptions, and uh, when you look at the best information that you have at the time, you uh, base your budget on that assumption. A, a budget is a plan. It is a long-range plan, and uh, we recognize that there are times when the revenue is up and times when the expense are up, so a balance between those two is what gives you a, a balanced budget. The Honourable Member for Pickrow East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Declining, declining personal income tax revenue is, a, is an indicator of a declining economy, and that slowdown will eventually come. And we'll see that in higher unemployment, and we'll see it in greater migration. It's, it's the economic canary in the coal mine. And yet today, in the budget table today, we see this government is quick to estimate an increase again in personal income tax uh, revenue, despite the reality of what's happened over the, past, over the past year. How can this government project continued economic growth in the face of the recent trend, which is downward revisions? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would remind the member and others to uh, go back to the budget speech that was presented today where we talked about 16,000 new uh, jobs, full-time jobs in the province. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, those new jobs, uh, the uh, consumer spending is up by 6% over last year. Those are all indicators that the economy is growing based on employment and spending. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the Minister has referred to increasing employment and increasing uh, jobs in the province. And, and I, I mean, I, I don't see that from the budget. And I'd like to refer the Minister, the minister to the budget documents today, page 70 and 71, where the, the indication is that the labor, labor force in 2013 was 497,000. It's, it's, it's for 2017 down to 490,000. That's, that's a reduction. Um, how can, how can the minister claim that jobs are increasing and things are great when the reality is personal income tax revenue is decreasing and being revised downward and the own numbers of this government refute the claim that there's more jobs? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I will go back to the 16,000 that I mentioned in the speech, and I will table the document which supports that. I said that since we took office, 2013, until now, there had been an increase of 16,000 uh, in the workforce. Uh, in 2013, that number was 359,500. In February of 2018, it was 375,500. My math gives 16,000. I'll table that. The Honourable Member for Victor East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would ask the minister to table that, to table that document um, so we can uh, understand the discrepancy. And maybe it's maybe it's a discrepancy between full time and people working uh, part time being added into there. It's, a, it's an important distinction because it's an indication of economic health. It's an indication of where our economy is going. So I would ask the minister, um, despite all the numbers about who's who's working and who might not be, we'll sort that out. The reality is, is that the personal income tax revenue projections are going down. They were revised downward between, between the, the spring budget and the fall budget, and, and the adjustments today show that even that downward revision wasn't high enough. If they keep going down, is the minister concerned that the numbers uh, for personal income tax revenue in this budget um, aren't a true indication of what's happening in the economy? The Honourable Minister of Finance. 
Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, to the member opposite, I did table that document. I'm sure you can get it and have a look at that. But as I said before, whenever you're building a budget, whenever you're making a plan, you have to look at revenue and expenses. You have to judge those uh, based on assumptions, based on projections, and build a budget based on that. We did that. Uh, yes, we're concerned when any revenue is going down, but we also have to make sure that we adjust our spending to accommodate that decrease. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Uh, this budget acknowledges that Nova Scotians are facing, are facing mental health crisis, Mr. Speaker, that they need more support. Unfortunately, what we've seen here is a drop in the bucket compared to what is needed. I was proud to be part of a government that established the province's first mental health and addiction strategy. Mr. Speaker, given the urgent need, why has this government failed to continue to update the work of this important strategy? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member uh, for both his, his question and his, and his work uh, around uh, mental health, uh, Mr. Speaker, during his time in office, and, and I'm sure Mr. Speaker's his question uh, addresses the continued uh, interest in this important area. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, uh, the work that's ongoing, it's, uh, Nova Scotians would know that there have been a number of initiatives that we've taken since uh, forming government uh, to receive uh, feedback and recommendations from experts. Uh, there's a minister's uh, panel uh, that have made a number of recommendations. We had uh, Dr. Stan Kucher respond to uh, an emerging uh, situation uh, last June, Mr. Speaker, uh, received recommendations from the Auditor General. Uh, all of this work uh, supports uh, our efforts to uh, update uh, the strategy uh, to move forward, uh, Mr. Speaker, continued investments as mental health priorities. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. No mention in the budget speech today about the addiction, uh, mental health and addiction strategy. Uh, did, they did mention a $2.9 million increase to the budget for mental health, which is about 1%. That's less than the rate of inflation uh, and amounts to status quo in real terms, Mr. Speaker. The budget for addiction services last year was underspent by $2.5 million. The budget for the IWK mental health services underspent by a $1 million. The Nova Scotia Health Authority mental health services underspent by $750 million, Mr. Speaker. So if the minister knows Nova Scotians need more mental health support, why don't we see that reflected in this year's budget? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, we continue to recognize the uh, needs of Nova Scotians. Uh, we've also uh, acknowledged, Mr. Speaker, that the recruitment efforts are ongoing to uh, secure the mental health clinicians that we need in our communities uh, across Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the full range of uh, clinicians, Mr. Speaker, from psychiatrists to psychologists uh, and social workers, uh, nurse practitioners, physicians, Mr. Speaker, uh, all, all of the healthcare professionals that provide supports to our Nova Nova Scotians, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to, to let the, the member know that we are having successes. Uh, just recently, as part of our collaborative care practices, we recognized the role that social workers play, uh, had the opportunity to announce uh, new social workers joining collaborative practices in Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is growth, this is progress, and this is the work that we continue to be committed to move forward on. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism. Uh, in this budget year, it looks like there's going to be less money for tourism compared to the previous year, uh, including uh, less money for marketing. Um, in my constituency, we have, as I mentioned before, Fisherman's Cove, where we don't have any place to dock a boat if you want to come over from Halifax or Bedford or even Dartmouth. So I'm just wondering if the Minister can explain to us what they're doing in terms of trying to help increase the tourism in our area, as well as whether there's efforts to help us get the wharf that we need to increase our tourism. Thank you, the Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister responsible for tourism. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, obviously, the, the budget uh, is reflective of what uh, not only the government, but the, the private sector, the stakeholders are doing uh, to reach that $4 billion goal uh, of tourism revenue uh, by 2024. Uh, currently, we are at $2.7 billion at this point, uh, which is significant. Uh, and, and and there's a number of sectors, a number of uh, different areas, large and small, that have a role to play. I don't know the specifics of the member's uh, constituency and, and what that entails, but I'd be happy to have that conversation. But we look at the broad uh, issues, such as marketing, which is a big one. Uh, we let the experts and the third-party players uh, do that for us, and they do a great job. We look at our investments in our infrastructure, uh, which has been significant and historic. And of course, the direct air access, which is going to make a big difference for the tourism complement here in Nova Scotia. We're doing great things, and the tourism sector are leading that charge. Thank you. Yeah, for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that answer. My question now is to the Minister of Community Services. Um, last uh, three years, uh, there was a $6 million budget for the uh, sexual violence strategy. And in this year's budget document, it says that at-risk women will be getting a $2 million fund grant for community projects, research, and other initiatives focusing on preventing domestic violence and supporting victims. So I'm wondering if that $2 million is a continuation of that $6 million program or if that program funding has been completely cut and now we have a different budget for sexual assault victims. Thank the you. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I want to thank the Honourable Member uh, for that question. Of course, we want to uh, support victims of violence, whether it's sexual violence or domestic violence. As we indicated previously, there will uh, the sexual violence strategy was ending. There, were t there was $2 million uh, in the budget for each of the years of the sexual violence strategy. Uh, there is a $1 million continuing continuing forward on sexual violence and of course sexual violence can also be domestic violence so there is money for that as well. There is also money going to, uh, to health for uh, the continuation of trauma counselling. Just before we move on to the uh, next question, I want to remind the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage that the supplementary question is intended to be a supplement to your first question, not a separate question from your first question. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Nova Scotians are waiting for the province's report on school inclusion. And according to the latest information from the Department of Education, uh, they are not due to release the final report until next week. Despite this, the Department has earmarked $15 million to implement the recommendations from the Commission. The Commission website claims that submissions are still under deliberation. The budget figure, or the certainty of the budget figure, would indicate that the Minister already has a copy of the report. My question is this, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister tell us how long he's had the report, or did his Department simply make up an amount for the inclusion recommendations? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I do not have a copy of the report. That report has not been submitted uh, to the Department yet, uh, nor to the Union. Those are the two groups that the Commission is uh, mandated to deliver that report to. Uh, I will say, though, in our uh, budget deliberations, we did consult with the Commission on um, a realm of what the financial ask would be, because we did want to ensure that it was embedded in the budget. Uh, so that we could move on that report as swiftly as possible. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Mr. Speaker, $15 million works out to about $40,000 per school in our province, and that might, that might, be enough to, that might not be enough to pay uh, for what's required to, to tackle the issues uh, within our classroom. Now, without the report, Mr. Speaker, there's no way to know what is, what is intended to cover and whether it will be enough. Without that report, this House cannot properly examine the budget for this initiative. My question is this, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister indicate whether the $15 million will be ongoing funding or is it a one-time spend? Thank the you, Honourable Mr. Minister Speaker. of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think it's important to clarify for the member in the House that there is a difference between the fiscal year of the government and the academic year uh, of our schools. So that $15 million would actually be re, uh, um, representative of a half a year, half an academic year investment, Mr. Speaker. We believe that those dollars are significant. Uh, we know that we have to do a better job in terms of providing more behavioral supports, uh, mental health supports, psychology, uh, psych psychologist supports, speech pathologist supports, Mr. Speaker. And we are committed, as we have been in every single Liberal budget, to investing more and more dollars in our education system. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. As we heard in the budget today, Mr. Speaker, one of the priorities of this government is to enable young people to stay here in Nova Scotia, put down roots, and leave fulfilling lives. Unfortunately, there's been an exodus of young people from our province, and that hurts us economically and culturally. All our young people want to do is, is have the opportunity we've all had and enjoyed, a chance to get an education, find a job, and settle into a productive role in our community. And all too often, our young people don't see a future here at home and leave for greener pastures. So my question to the minister is, why is the minister content to watch our best and brightest go down the road to build their lives? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to draw the uh, member's attention to Stats Canada, which has recently said 
Nova Scotia for the last two years is retaining more youth than it's losing. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that's the first time it's happened since the 1980s. Mr. Speaker, what we are doing is we're keeping our youth here. We're giving them opportunities, not only in government, but in the private sector. Graduate opportunities, graduate innovation. Today's budget had $20 million more in a research fund, which goes to our youth, which goes to our brightest. Look at all the great work happening at both the labs, the sandboxes, Cove. Mr. Speaker, I could go on and on, but one minute is not enough. But Mr. Speaker, what there is happening in this province is a lot of excitement. Our youth have opportunities here, and they're embracing the opportunities and going to work. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, recently I had a young man in my office who applied for a job creation program to help him stay at home and contribute in his community till he can find work in his field. He was denied that grant, told that he didn't have enough of a job search in his pocket, and look, told by the ENS staff to look outside this province for work in his field. Yet this government is telling him to do just that, leave here to look for a job outside his field. So why is the minister driving our trained young people to other provinces instead of them helping him stay here to build a better future? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, we're doing nothing of the such. I'm going to draw the members' attention to a policy change that was done at the Public Service Commission while I was the minister there. When I became the minister of that department, every single job posting in the province of Nova Scotia said you need two years of experience. That meant anyone graduating from university or our colleges had to go somewhere to get two years of experience. So what the government's message was, was go to another province, get experience, then we'll take you back when you have that experience. This government changed that policy, Mr. Speaker. I'll repeat that again because I heard the member yelling and I think he should hear this. This government changed that policy. And Mr. Speaker, after it changed that policy, 1,000... Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, once that policy change was made, 1,800 youth got jobs in the Public Service Commission who would never have had that opportunity before. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. In Cape Breton, not a month goes by without a weekend where the emergency rooms in New Waterford, Glace Bay and the Northside General are all closed. So my question to the Minister is this. Mr. Speaker, what is the Minister's excuse for failing to take any action to keep emergency rooms open on Cape Breton Island? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for uh, the question. As the, the member knows, uh, investing in our uh, health care system is a priority for this government, a significant part of the budget that was tabled by my colleague, the Minister of Finance, uh, earlier today, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing significant investments and expanded investments in our uh, health care uh, budget, Mr. Speaker, uh, providing investments uh, to support uh, our, our partners uh, throughout uh, initiatives in mental health and primary care access, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're going to continue with these investments on behalf of Nova Scotians from one end of the province in Cape Breton, but also all the way down to Yarmouth as well. The, uh, the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Mr. Speaker, during the difficult times when fi families find themselves in an emergency, they should be able to count on their local emergency rooms to be open. But under this Liberal government, not a new single collaborative care emergency centre has opened, and actually the mobile care team in the Waterford has closed. So Mr. Speaker, is the Minister satisfied standing by while families across Nova Scotia show up to emergency rooms that are closed? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we continue uh, to work with our partners, Mr. Speaker, to uh, ensure that uh, emergency rooms are, and emergency services across this province are available to Nova Scotians. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's an integrated system of uh, health care services. It's one of the reasons why we uh, have a, a single uh, health authority, the Nova Scotia Health Authority, to ensure that services are provided at uh, multiple sites throughout the province, ensuring that the, the standards, Mr. Speaker, of care being provided. We have an amazing uh, first-class emergency health uh, 
health service uh, ambulance system, Mr. Speaker. The paramedics, uh, Mr. Speaker, in Nova Scotia are top notch. They have uh, excellent equipment, Mr. Speaker, to provide care to all Nova Scotians from one end of the province to the other. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I did try to attempt to uh, get this question in prior to the break, but time ran short, so we're going to try again today. Through you to the uh, Minister of Education. Uh, parents have continued to express concerns to me about maximum distance that the province and school boards are setting for walking and busting. Distances set provincially at 3.6 kilometres are for st before students can be bused whether they're 5 or 18 years old. Halifax Regional School Board has a policy of 2.4 kilometres, which many parents in HRM already feel is too far. The Minister did say that a standardised policy across the province is one of the objectives of centralisation and in September the minister stated there are many out there who would argue that having our children walk to school is a healthy exercise. My question is, will the minister commit to coming out to my constituency and joining myself and a five-year-old to walk the 7.2 to school and back? The Honourable Minister of Education. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I took up the member from Pictou Centre's offer on a walk on the beach. I'd be happy to take the member's offer on a walk uh, along these streets in his riding. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, the minister is in probably uh, a little bit younger and better shape than me, so it won't be as hard for him, I'm sure. Uh, Halifax Regional School Board, Mr. Speaker. You uses its discretion based on more than just distance. However, at the end of this month, of course, Halifax Regional School Board's not going to be there anymore. Uh, parents are left with anxiety and they're worrying about the safety of their children who are walking to school at distances that they may have to now walk. Will the minister commit today that the busting distance for students in grades primary to six within the HRM will continue at the 2.4 kilometers and not increase? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to work with our regional education centres to ensure that our kids are safe getting to and from school and that we have the best practices that are applied in every single region of this province. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On October 17th, I asked the Minister of Education about a constituent whose daughters, uh, whose daughters were walking 47 minutes to school, crossing one of the busiest streets in our province. The minister stated, if indeed there are safety concerns that are being expressed by parents, they do need to be properly addressed by the school board. And I can table that, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, it may surprise the minister to hear there are safety concerns being expressed by parents. This mother has logged dozens of phone calls searching for the solution since May. She's been to every possible level of the education system, and her daughters are still walking 47 minutes to school daily, crossing one of the busiest streets in Nova Scotia. My question is this. With power about to be taken away from elected school boards, will the minister take charge of Colleen Hollihan's uh, issue and find a solution to safely get her daughters to school? The Honourable Minister Speaker. of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Transportation has been an issue of concern primarily in the, in the uh, HRM uh, area, and that is something that we're going to be taking a look at because safety is paramount to getting our kids to and from our schools uh, in a way that we know we can all be, uh, be comfortable with. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Mr. Speaker, on January 31st, uh, my office sent a letter to the superintendent of the HRSB as well as to the minister's office. This letter proposed, Mr. Speaker, a very reasonable solution to get Colleen Hollihan's daughters on a school bus. This letter has gone unanswered, and Colleen's daughters continue to walk to school. My question is this, Mr. Speaker. Why has the minister failed to respond to my office's simple request to help my constituent get her daughters to and from school safely? The Thank Honourable you, Minister Speaker. of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That's because we want to look at uh, potential solutions with the regional executive director to make sure that all options are being considered before we provide a response to the member on behalf of his constituent. 
The Honourable House Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is, is for the Minister of Education Early Childhood Development as well. I've asked about Ecole Wedgeport a number of times in this House, but I haven't uh, asked the Minister so I can get him on answered. Uh, Ecole Wedgeport is a school of about 100 students in a small Francophone community in my constituency and a very close neighbour to the Minister's uh, own constituency as well. And we've been seeking some significant renovation or complete replacement uh, for that school. Uh, the current facility is facing some serious physical challenges that makes it a difficult learning environment. My question, is the Minister able to tell this House if the capital plan in today's budget includes the much needed work for Ecole Wedgeport? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As the uh, Minister of Finance stated earlier today, uh, the capital plan is not being released with this budget, although the dollars are um, invested in this budget to, to make sure that we're able to conduct uh, that, that, that capital program. However, we are looking at the Auditor General's recommendations along with Dr. Glaze's recommendations to improve that process so that it's longer term and that we have a process for capital planning that is predictable and that the public can have full faith and confidence in. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much. Uh, Eckel Wedgeport has been on the top of the CCAP's capital plan for the last 12 years. And I've tabled petitions in this House as well. And with recent changes to the Education Act, I believe that Eckel Wedgeport now sits at the top uh, of uh, half of the capital plans or half of the school boards uh, in this province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the last time any investment was done uh, on this school was when the Minister of Finance uh, was the Minister of uh, Education in the previous government. In a previous government, I just want to say. Uh, and I, of course, thanked her at that time for her investment, but it was to hold over money until the school could get a replacement. So my question is, how long will this project sit at the top of the list before your department will allocate its capital funding? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I've actually toured uh, Wedge at Cole Wedgeport uh, myself with members of the community and the SAC and the school board and the CSAP. Um, and I agree with the member that there, we do need a new school uh, for that community. It's important to preserve the culture uh, and language uh, of Wedgeport and the surrounding area. And um, I want to see a new school in that community, Mr. Speaker. I will say that uh, we, do, we will not have a finalized capital list uh, until uh, June, as the Minister of Finance said today. But I think uh, once we solidify a better process for capital planning, a long-term process uh, for that planning, I think members of the public will be very satisfied with that list at the end of the day. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, uh, today the Minister of Finance and Treasury Board told us that the budget building involves establishing a set of economic assumptions that become the foundation upon which the budget is built. A central part of that foundation, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> A central foundation of that, uh, a part, a central part of that foundation, Mr. Speaker, is the wage pattern that has not been agreed to uh, by many of the groups the government is still trying to negotiate with. Mr. Speaker, is the Minister of Finance satisfied to build a budget around this faulty assumption? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to commend the member for uh, the actual quote. Uh, you have it correct. Uh, you heard correctly. We do base our, our budget on assumptions. We do uh, uh, recognize that as I said earlier, any budget is a plan. There are, uh, you have to monitor closely the revenues and the expenses. What we've done over the last uh, three years is to be able to build some capacity within our budget each year for unexpected expenses, and we will certainly continue to make sure that if there is an unexpected expense that we have capacity to respond to that. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, not only uh, have the workers of the province not agreed to the wage pattern, this issue is now before the court. The economic assumption of this government bu budget may be found uh, to be unconstitutional, Mr. Speaker. That has been the case in a number of uh, provinces across the country. What is the minister's plan if the courts decide the basis of this budget is illegal? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I know that uh, members opposite uh, like to use the word unconstitutional. Uh, however, uh, we do know that uh, we await the rulings of the court. We're fairly confident in the ruling of that, uh, but we will certainly respect that ruling, whatever it may be. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question to you is 
to the Minister of Natural Resources. Last week, my colleague asked the Minister of TIR about a situation in West Chesapeake that has local residents very worried. I'm talking about the berm that separates the freshwater lake from the ocean. The berm was breached in January and again in March. Meetings were held, but nothing has been done to address the breaches. Of course, residents are worried that all the fish in the lake will be killed or washed away. But they also fear that their wells will be contaminated and the basements flooded with seawater. With every stormy weather report, those fears become greater. So my question to you, to the Minister, when will the CBC, CBCL's consultant report be complete and when can the people of East Chester Cook expect to see some action to address the problems with this perm? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the Honourable Member for bringing this question forward. It's something that the Speaker himself has been advocating for very strongly, uh, a great representative of his community. Oh. <laughs> or, order, please. Order, please. <laughs> order, please. <laughs> Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. We'll now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes government business for today. On a great budget day, we'll call it, uh, call it at that. Uh, I move that the House to now rise to meet again tomorrow, Wednesday, March 21st, 2018, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 8 p.m., following daily routine and QP and opposition business, we will move to budget responses from the opposition. And with that, I ask the House Leader for the official opposition to provide tomorrow's agenda. The Honourable House Leader for the official opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Government House Leader for that. Uh, after a regular routine and question period, we'll be calling two bills. Uh, they were introduced today, Bill, I believe, 88, which is the Mental Health App, and Bill 89, which is Life Skills Course. So, Mr. Speaker, I move that you now rise to meet again tomorrow between the hours of 1 and 8. Sorry, did I get them wrong there? Uh, Bill 90. Bill 90. I'm going to look around. So let me call 90 in case, just to make sure I have all of them. Uh, so I'll call Bill 90 as well. So again, I move you do now rise to meet again tomorrow between the hours of 1 and 8 p.m. Motion is for adjournment for the House to rise tomorrow, Wednesday, March 20th, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 8 p.m. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. The House now stands adjourned until tomorrow at 1 p.m.